Okay, can I declare the meeting open and welcome members along to back to our normal day of Thursday morning, which is great. Um, so just so everyone's aware, um, we have everybody in the room other than um, Jonathan Buckley and Mark Durkin, who are both coming in via start, starting. Um, before I start, have members any declaration of interest that they want to at the, uh, declare at this stage? No, nothing? That's okay. Then we'll move on to apologies, and we don't have any apologies as we have a full house today. And then I'll move on to agenda item number two, which is chairperson's business. Um, firstly, I'll just update members. We had a chairperson's liaison group meeting on Tuesday lunchtime. Um, so the issue of committee room space was something that was debated and discussed. Um, every, every committee is in the same position, as you are well aware, and we, there, there's very little room or space to hold any extra meetings. Um, now, what a lot of the committees have done, and I don't want to have to do it, but if we do have to do it, I will, is a lot of the committees have gone down to only allowing six members in the room at any one time. Um, we just know that our committee meetings, some committee meetings could last two or three hours, and if we're all in a, an enclosed space, it's not, it, I don't think it's, it's, it's overly healthy. Um, for too many members to be in the room. So it's just again, I said it last week, and it's just to encourage members again, if you can do this via Starleaf and do this from home, then it would help the committee out greatly. Um, we have got witnesses who are coming in today as well, so that's going to make things um, even more overcrowded. I know, Robin, you can just stay there. You'll be fine. We'll move. I'm <laughs> sorry, right, Chair. I have to apologise. I have to leave at 11.30, so... No, that's Apologies. fine. That's okay. So it's just, I mean, the, the committee rooms over the coming weeks, especially when we start looking at the, uh, going through the bill and we, we look at the clause by clause that will be coming up shortly, um, then it, it will be quite difficult to facilitate uh, lots of people in the room. So it's just want you all to bear that in mind. If you can do this from home, I, I would appreciate it if you, if, if that, if you could do that, that would be great. Um, then also then I want to inform members that the Public Finance Scrutiny Unit from RAISE has offered to provide a presentation to the committee to support our engagement with the department's budget planning process. And the presentation would take place during a committee meeting in the near future. Um, members, any questions or queries on that or would they be happy to get that just little bit of extra <coughs> support? Uh, and doing that, I, I always am a great believer that you know any training or even refresher training, it, it can't go wrong. It's it's good to have. Um, so if members are okay, we'll get that put in, plan that for a future meeting. And then also the committee team has investigated room availability for our plan, planning and stakeholder briefing session, and the only feasible time for these is going to be a Tuesday afternoon. Um, due to the need for the star leaf. Um, so I know it's not going to be possible for all members to attend because we've got question time. Um, I mean, anybody that was here in previous mandates will know that committees often had to meet. I certainly know, <coughs> I remember with Welfare Reform Bill, that yep. uh, we met nearly every Tuesday afternoon with the TV in the corner letting us know when it was our time to go in and ask a question at question time. So um, that's just going to be, I think that will be part of the norm going forward again because we've got so much work to do um, on a statutory fitting, never mind our informal meetings. So that's where we are at the moment, only availability is Tuesday afternoon. Chair, can I just say, um, I know that the, the, the group that meets, is, it's great actually that all the chairs meet. Can I make a request actually from this committee then that we're being held back by Starleaf as opposed to room availability? Could, could the chairs group perhaps write to the commission and tell them we need another Starleaf licence then? Because it's not, I, I just think it's not appropriate for us to have to dip in and out of the chamber. Um, it will happen though, yeah. Kelly. It's, that is what has happened in every mandate. Whenever we are doing bills, so you will have committees maybe two or three times a week. Yeah, I, I just I, I think it's just a bit suboptimal, especially given the fact that the chamber has the COVID restrictions within it, um, and cleaning it and in and out. It's just if it's Starleaf, it's, I know that there may well be multiple meetings, but if it's Starleaf that's causing this. Yeah. Really? Well, I know I can tell you that on Tuesday I formally proposed that we write to the speaker because it's the speaker we need to write to about the room. Uh, if we don't have the rooms available to hold the meetings, um, that we can socially distance in a safe way, yeah. um, then the, the star leaf is secondary to that really. Um, so we're, we're looking at the, the chamber, the members' dining room, long gallery, all of those places where we're able to facilitate meetings um, at proper social distancing. Um, so, but I mean, it, it is just going to be, we've got so much to pack in before the end of this mandate. 
And I mean, I know Robin and Fra were both here, uh, you know, a lot longer than me as well. And I certainly remember during welfare reform scrutiny, we were sometimes three times a week in this room doing scrutiny, you know, and it, it is, it's hard to manage it. But it was mostly separating the rows. That's right, it was mostly separating the rows. But I've seen in uh, some of the debates and question times on the dial, and uh, they, they use other locations, they uh, use the, the, the chamber, and a lot uh, they, they have it. Uh, down to a T, you know, but I think we need to wait, widen it up, and uh, because it would be difficult for some people, and uh, the 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 to do it at a remote location, if the they're, they're constantly trying to uh, deal with uh, difficulties with the, the with their broadband provision uh, and stuff uh, like that. Yeah, I know that is a factor, and I know certainly for you, it, it's a big factor. Um, as it is, I think Johnny is having a few difficulties this morning. Um, us Belfasties seem to forget that at times that we can log on very quickly and very easily and stay in a meeting without any problems. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I, I think you're right, Fra, and that's one of the reasons why we've written to the Speaker for the use of the Assembly Chamber um, on the days that it's not being used, that committees that can then use it, because the way it is now, and it's the same with this committee today, we have a deadline of half one today. We have to be out of here for half one because there's another committee in at two o'clock. So it's not as if we can, if we have a lot to do, we can say, well, let's just do a full day or let's run on to three. We just can't do it um, because there, there isn't the, the availability of space and Starleaf as well, as Kelly said. Um, so those those have been discussed certainly at the CLG, and uh, we've now asked to put that into you know sort of into form <coughs> writing now. So if things get as bad as they're predicting, it's going to get. Uh, does it have to be on here? Well, this is another issue um, that was discussed because I had mentioned to use, um, I don't think I'm breaking any confidences by discussing this. You weren't at the meeting, were you? No. no. Um, the, the issue to do with our outside visits, remember I'd come back to the committee and said, um, this looks like a gore, we're going to be able to do outside visits. There's a bit of an issue here now because it's up to the committee clerk or clerks to go out and see if that venue is fit for purpose, can it be used, you know, will it meet all the... The, what we need, um, and because of the added added COVID nineteen stuff now as well, um, it, it's putting a lot of pressure on our committee staff then to say yes, this is this is a place that can be used. So they're they're having to take a wee bit of legal advice on that now. Um, so we'll get back to you okay, on that and how that works because it does put a lot of pressure on committee staff to say yes, this is a perfect place and we can use this. And then if something happens. Um, then, yeah, we can all blame them then, basically. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's the issue with that. Look, can I just then ask you, and I know this is Tuesday is not perfect, it's far from perfect, but we, we are where we are, and we do need to meet these people. So it's just to say that even if we could do a pilot one, we'll do a pilot meeting, and it would be then on the house, we'll invite all of the housing groups in, at the one time, the ones that have contacted us will invite them in. It will be more like a round table then, um, where they'll all they'll come in by a star leaf, obviously, um, where they'll all get a chance maybe to say, you know, for their five minute presentation, and then we can then question them. So it's you know it it will be a, maybe a two hour long session, but um, I think it would be worthwhile. And as I say, it will be a pilot. And if we find as members this doesn't work for us. Um, then we have the option of, of trying to look at, at something else. The members agree to that if we do it as a pilot for one of them. And sure, you said we'd have a TV in the corner in case any of us have to leave. Yeah, yeah right, that's, yeah. And that's what has happened in any of the other meetings I've had over the years that took place on Monday and Tuesdays. Yeah, yeah we would have. Um, and I'm saying that I know when welfare reform bill, because it was a bill we were doing, we were taken out of, the members were taken out of the, the oh. oral ballot. So they were because that then was able to facilitate um, the, the bill's process. Mm. Um, we're not. This is an informal meeting, so this is slightly different. But um, so with members, we'll just we'll run it as a pilot. We'll try and see if we can get something slotted into the diary, um, uh, maybe uh, just shortly after uh, recess. Um, not members all right with that? Can we get confirmation of that? It's just if, if we are being taken out of. <coughs> yeah, well, I, I said that at least two weeks we need in order to be taken out of the Thank ballot. Um, but as I say, it's an informal meeting, so it may not constitute being taken out of the ballot. It's up to each member's party whether they decide that's good enough reason to be taken out of the ballot or not. Different if it's a bill that we're, we're, we're doing. All right, can I move on <coughs> from that bit then? Members are in agreement. Um, let me just see. I've had all of my 
for a person's business? I think it is. If it's not, I can come back to something. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'll move on then to agenda item three, which is the draft minutes. Remember, you'll find these at page six of your meeting pack, and I've been handed something, so I already haven't done something. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Johnny. <laughs> Johnny's only on audio, so I'll have to just remember him. So remembers remind me to yes. ask Johnny if he wants to speak at all, because we can't see him. Johnny, you have no issues on that last bit that we were discussing? No, no problem. Just as long as you can hear. I didn't know whether it was connected or not that it was that it was listening. No, we can hear you, so we can. Um, so Thanks. again, members, agenda item three, the draft minutes, um, page six of your meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes as drafted of the 30th September 2020? Great. Thank you. Then we'll move on to agenda item four, which is matters arising. And just bear with me here because there's several things here as well. Um, you've been provided at page 13 with a departmental letter on the timetable for the production of the social inclusion strategies. I ask members any comments or they content to note. Content to note, yes? Yeah. Thank you. And then go to, if members could go to page 36, there's a draft response on the, on, on the procedures for the use of LCMs. Um, again, members, are they happy um, that we forward this on to the Clerk of the Committee of Procedures? Content? Yeah, all content. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then, members, um, following on from the recent planning session we have uh, we had with RAISE, um, members will be provided at page 38 with an update on the timetable for the research papers. And the researchers have agreed to produce... Uh, uh, that they have produced, agreed to produce to support the committee. Um, members, happy again, or any comments? Content to note that? Yeah? Okay. All good? Okay. And then, members, you've been, and this is the one I need to bear with me on this one just a wee while. Uh, members, have been provided a page 40 with copies of the latest report of the examiner's statutory rules. The examiner draws attention to the following rules, SR 2020-120, the Local Government Accounts and Audit Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, SR 2020-147, the Social Security Electronic Communications Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, SR 2020-148, the Social Fund and Social Security Claims and Payments Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and SR 2020-167, the statutory sick pay general coronavirus amendment number five regulations northern ireland 2020 uh, the members these rules were laid in breach of the 21 day rule however the examiner of statutory rules is content with the department's explanation for the breaches can i ask members are they content to note this also no. yep thank you okay then members you've been provided at page 57 with a draft response to the minister on the outcome report of the consultation on gambling in northern ireland um, the uh, response incorporates the members' comments from the last two meetings. So, can I ask members, are they content that this letter now gets forwarded on to the Minister? We really don't want to hold it up any longer. Yeah, content. Good stuff. Thank you again. Um, just checking nobody's hands up. No. Okay, then we're going to move on to agenda item number five which is the committee consideration in relation to EU exit statutory instruments. Um, members, you'll find this paper um, on your agenda, I, I, this on your packet, page 60. Um, the First and Deputy First Minister informed the Speaker in August 2020 that in order to prepare for the end of the transition period, they, estim they estimated that 114 UK government made um, statutory instru instruments in relation to devolved matters would be required that number has now been reduced to 90. As far as we're aware, there will be three such SIs um, to be dealt with by this committee. Um, where a Northern Ireland minister agrees that such an SI should apply to Northern Ireland, this means that the le legislation will be made without the opportunity for the Assam Assembly to carry out uh, its usual scrutiny. Therefore, where Northern Ireland Minister proposes to take this course of action, it is important that the relevant committee is informed why and has the opportunity to consider and challenge the rationale for doing so. In carrying out this task, the committee should be clear they will not be carrying out scrutiny of a draft SI. This scrutiny will be carried out by Parliament. Instead, we will be considering... Um, 
I've lost my page, considering the Minister's proposal that a UK Government Minister should make an SI that applies to Northern Ireland in a devolved matter. Just bear with me, just to read all of this. In doing so, the Committee should consider whether the proposed change is necessary, and if so, why an SI is the appropriate legislative vehicle as opposed to a statutory rule which would be subject to Assembly scrutiny. Departments are aware that committees will require an explanation in relation to this. Ideally, the committee should be able to reach a view on whether or not to support the Minister's proposal. However, in circumstances where members believe that they have had insufficient time or information in order to reach the view, they may wish to record this as their position as an, an alternative to either supporting or opposing the Minister's proposal. The Committee will expect the Minister to give careful consideration to whatever position the Committee reaches on a proposal. However, it should be noted that the final decision to advise the UK Government that an SI on a devolved matter should apply to Northern Ireland rests with the Northern Ireland Minister. So thank you for listening to that. Members, any questions or comments they want to make on that? Yeah, go ahead, Kelly. I just wanted to ask, um, obviously, if we're being provided with information, um, it needs to be timely to give us time to review that. I'm just wondering how quickly Westminster will be able to get us across that information. Is, is there a time period before it hits committee uh, where we have access to those papers and that information to, to review? We don't want to be landing, for instance, you know, Thursday morning for us to consider on Thursday, because things will be fast moving. There's so much coming through. Um, it's just... Thankfully, the, the, I mean, out of all of that, what was it, 90 or 90 yeah. something, three of them will only apply to our committee. Okay. Thank goodness, a lot of them will be dearer. Yeah. Um, but thankfully, we are three. Um, Janice, do you want to? Do you know that? Uh, we can we can find that out, and I okay. can certainly speak to the other clerks who are dealing with more, you know, to see what's happening. Okay, Sinead. Yeah, thanks, sir. I suppose um, just reading through the pack, and there's quite a lot to digest in that. Um, but the bit in it where it says that we, the committee won't be, give, won't be allowed to see any drafts of the SIs, why, why is that? I know, obviously, when you read on, it, it doesn't really matter because regardless of the position we um, arrive at, it's going to be deemed, you know, it'll be overridden by whatever, um, whatever the UK government decides. So is there a reason why we can't see a draft regardless of that? Uh, well, I think it's. I think the issue is more that the Northern Ireland Minister will make the final decision as to whether they they will go with the SI or will take an alternative route through an SR. So it's it's more the fact of that decision is the key one, you know. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I obviously as Paula has said, we you would like as a committee to think that the minister will take on board a view that you will take on it, and there is still scope to. To change that, it will be just the Northern Ireland Minister's decision as to whether, um, the uh, you know the SI is the appropriate route for Northern Ireland. Okay, members, it's a because it's a wait and see. Mm -hmm. Um, whenever they do start to come through, thankfully, as I said, we only have three that seem to be applied to this committee. Um, other committees are going to have an awful lot more, um, but we'll just wait and see what happens. Okay, Johnny, did you have anything you wanted to ask in that? No, I'm fine, sure. Thank you. All right, no bother. Okay, members, we're going to then move on to our agenda item six, which is a solace briefing on COVID-19 funding to councils. Members, you'll find this at agenda item page 85 of your meeting packs. And then can I welcome to the meeting um, Jackie Dixon, who's the Chief Executive of Antrim and Newton Abbey Council, Suzanne Wiley, Chief Executive of Belfast City Council, Alfie Dallas and JJ Tohill. Um, uh, you are all very welcome. Glad, good to have you back in front of us again. Jackie, can I ask you to go ahead and begin your briefing? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for your warm welcome this morning um, and the opportunity to address your committee again. Um, I suppose really in response to your request, uh, Chair, for an update on the financial impact that COVID-19 has had and continues to have in local councils, um, you'll be aware that we have submitted a paper um, and there is a lot of detail in that, but hopefully that does describe the ongoing situation in local councils and perhaps more importantly it stresses the short and medium term financial risks that we are facing as a result of the ongoing pandemic. The other thing I would like to do this morning just for the committee is to highlight that that paper has also been endorsed by NILGA. So again, we're very much working in partnership right across local government. 
I think, Chair, you know, we do all recognise now that councils have a very key role to play in terms of the social, economic and environmental recovery of our communities. But really, the, the message that we want to try and put forward this morning is that to really achieve this and to continue to do that, we need to have a sustainable funding model in place. And we are concerned that we do not have that at, at present. And we are going to elaborate on that this morning. I want to begin just share briefly, obviously, to acknowledge the very significant support that has been given to councils to date in the current financial year. I do think um, that it is important for us just to pause and to reflect on that. And we do want to put on record this morning our appreciation um, to everybody who was involved in that. Uh, it has really made a huge difference to all of the councils. It does allow us to remain solvent and to provide those very critical services in the current financial year. In addition to this, Chair, I just want to take a few moments this morning to recognise as well, on behalf of um, local government, all of the support that has been given to our local community organisations and indeed to our local businesses who are significant rate payers in each of the council areas. And, and just briefly, Chair, just to give everybody some feedback, um, the mayor of my council and I visited Belfast International Airport recently, and Graham Cady there was telling us about the, the huge difference that the intervention that he has had has made to his business, albeit they are still operating in extremely challenging in, in an extremely challenging environment. But I think it is important that we do take time to reflect on all of the assistance that has been given in very, very difficult circumstances to our local communities and to our businesses and, and to put on record our appreciation um, to central government for that. So, Chair, our, our focus for this morning really is the impact that a predicted economic downturn um, will have on councils in terms of how we strike our rates over the next two years and probably beyond that term as well. Because if you expect, Chair, councils end up in a significant deficit position at the end of this financial year, this, will, this is going to erode any reserves that we currently hold or it will be have to it'll have to be factored into next year's budgets in terms of any money that we need to repay to land and property services. So that, that's the, really the focus for our meeting this morning. And Chair, if, if if you were agreeable, what I would like to do now is hand over to Suzanne Wiley of Belfast City Council just to talk us through some of the more detailed implication to that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, is that okay, Chair? Are you happy enough for, yes. for yes, Suzanne, go me ahead. to provide some evidence? Right, thank you very much. So just to remind um, members, um, the last time we, we spoke to you, um, we knew the situation was really serious um, and severe. Um, however, I don't think at that stage we knew um, you know, how long we were in this for um, and how prolonged um, this particular um, a situation uh, is, is at this point in time. Uh, so um, I think we have, you know, regrouped, um, we have reanalyzed um, where we are as well in local government. So uh, just to re-emphasize uh, some of those points, um, I would just reiterate what Jackie has said. Um, we work in partnership every day with DSA, so, um, and we really welcome that partnership working. Um, I, I particularly in the situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, we also are really grateful for the response that we have had um, from government, um, not only for our local businesses, for our arts sector, for our communities, um, but also in terms of our own um, finances, in terms of our income losses uh, in this period. Um, if you remember, um, in, and it's in the paper, um, local government is funded primarily through the rate base. So between somewhere between um, 70 and 80 percent, depending on which uh, council um, area you are in, comes from the rate base, so effectively from property taxes. Um, the rest will come from uh, income um, and fees and charges uh, and uh, rents and, and grants. Um, and by and large, um, what uh, we have been dealing with to date has been that loss of income from having to close um, and uh, uh, put severe restrictions on operations of some of our premises, which are income uh, generating. Um, but as we go forward into uh, next year and the year beyond, um, we have really serious concerns about um, the, the viability 
um, of uh, that rate base um, and, how, and what that will mean for local government finance um, going forward. Um, so, um, of course, um, it, it, you know, it is a vicious, it is a vicious circle. Um, because um, yeah, we're trying to support and top up businesses at this point in time. Um, if you think about what's happening in towns and city, cities um, across Northern Ireland as well, um, as um, there's been a reduction in the um, office sector, that's a big impact in terms of football in towns um, and city centres, and also in terms of sectors uh, like hospitality, if they're going back into uh, some sort of restricted lockdowns, um, etc. Uh, what impact that will have. So we're really worried about the vacancy rate going forward and then what impact that will, will have um, on the places and then um, that vicious circle in terms of what that will then mean in terms of the rate base. And obviously um, part of the rate base uh, goes to the executive, um, but it's a very small percentage of the overall budget that the executive has, but it's a massive percentage of the budget that uh, councils currently have. Um, and of course, um, then we will be faced with some very stark um, decisions that we're going to have to make going into the next um, few years. Um, because if that rate base um, falls significantly um, due to vacancies and also due to um, a, a revaluation that's going to take place in, in 2020 as well, um, then uh, we could find ourselves in uh, a completely uh, unsustainable situation. Um, and I think that that then could have the effect of undermining um, all the wonderful work that we have done in partnership um, between central and local government um, to um, really position um, local government as a delivery partner in delivering the, the programme for government and in particular delivering recovery initiatives um, to move us beyond COVID um, and uh, improve uh, the economy and to help support communities uh, as they suffer through this particular crisis. Um, we obviously have statutory services we have to provide, so they will have to come as, as number one. Um, we will want to avoid as many um, staff redundancies as we possibly can, but about 50 to 60 percent of our budget um, it goes on um, staff um, salaries. We will face uncontrollable costs because um, uh, as uh, they continue to rise um, over the next few years with um, salary increases that are set externally um, with increases in um, uh, uh, waste um, collections, for example, and disposal, they're going to, to hit us um, as well. Um, and obviously, we will continue to suffer from income losses um, because um, we know we're going to have to keep some of our plans closed and we may have to reclose um, as we go through the next um, period of time. And certainly, they're operating um, at a very reduced uh, level as well. So just take the market in Belfast for an example. Uh, normally, we would be getting an income for that on an annual basis, but currently we're having to pay um, out a premium to keep that going um, at this point in time. And it's essential we, we, we do that um, clearly. Uh, so those are the things we're faced with. Our discretionary services are, are incredibly important, um, as well as our statutory services, because, of course, we are investing in communities alongside DFC in particular, um, and we are we are also um, investing in capital regeneration schemes in partnership with many government departments, including um, DFC. We have our city deal um, that is ready to, to move forward, and obviously is matched funding between local government and central government. Um, and uh, and of course that is a for our economy, and of course we wouldn't want to be moving away and moving back um, from that. Um, but when we're faced um, at local level um, with um, a reduced income, a reduced rate, rate base, um, increasing uh, costs, and this choice between um, what we do in terms of redundancies, reduced services, or, invest, or reduced investments, it's going to be a very, very, very difficult situation. Of course, we know we have to make cuts, and we're absolutely up for making cuts, and that's not what this is about, um, because, of course, right across the board, we all know um, that, that we face that situation. Um, but what our concern is, uh, is that we will um, face um, a position uh, that we're unable to invest in those longer-term 
uh, recovery projects and uh, economic growth projects and, and social and arts um, projects as well in partnership um, with with others so, um, or we're going to have to increase the rate which really is not um, uh, palatable at all because it, in other words we'd just be putting more businesses out of business by doing that so we, we really don't want to do that so today really um, our ask is um, uh, that well first of all we want to thank you for your support so far but our ask is that we turn our eyes to the longer term horizon um, and we look at the next um, year and the uh, year after that as well. And our ask to um, the Department of Finance has been um, that we protect the amount of income that we're getting this year through the rate base, but somehow that is underwritten um, by uh, the uh, de department um, so that uh, we know what we're planning for over the next two years and so that we don't face an unsustainable um, local government um, where uh, we could see um, uh, you know, some uh, councils going into to bankrupt, let's say, which is certainly not, not the position we want uh, to be in. So that is the biggest ask that um, you know, we would like the committee uh, to consider how uh, that might be taken forward. Um, and uh, so um, we um, calculate the amount of income um, with um, the with LPS every year that we get through the rate and um, through what's known as the estimated penny product. And basically, what we're asking for is that the, that that estimate that was done for this year and um, for councils that that is protected for the next two years. So of course, that doesn't take account of any of the reduced income or any of the cuts. Um, that we're going to have to make, or um, uh, basically is flat rating uh, what we're getting this this year. Um, we also then um, just want to, to um, put um, in front of you, we need to work with LPS, um, and we need to get a lot of, uh, into the detail of a lot of the data so we can forecast um, uh, more effectively where these vacancies are going to arise um, and what impact that's going to have on each individual council area because it will be variable uh, across the board. So we have started that partnership um, but um, we need to work at pace now um, and we know that um, the department has said that we do have more leeway in terms of the date that is statutorily set for us to set our rate which is February. Uh, and um, obviously we need to move that because we need more time for planning and we would like to align it with the regional rate so that we're all um, singing from the same hymn sheet when we come to set uh, the rate for, for next year. And of course, um, um, going forward, um, we will want to work in partnership with you as a committee and in partnership with your department um, to look at what other investments uh, need to be made so that we really can support our community, our businesses, and our towns and city centres. We really, you know, we love the revitalisation fund, for example. Um, but of course, there's there's to be a task force set up by the um, first minister and deputy first minister, and we look forward to what that might um, bring forward for our towns and city centres as well. And in terms of the finance, you will know that the partnership panel agreed that there would be a task and finish group which would look at the areas of finance that I have just talked about. So thank you very much indeed, members. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Suzanne, for your brief. Um, can I just first of all start? Um, it, it, it's always good for us to hear the positives as well. Um, I know this period of COVID, um, very much of our committee meetings have been very, it has been negative and there's been reasons for that. So it's good to hear the positives. Um, it's good to hear that uh, the department are working closely and working well um, along with yourselves. And I mean, that, that way there will be no nasty surprises along the road for, for anyone in, in, in this. Um, so can I just thank you for, for stating that and um, we'll put it on record as well as a committee um, that, that, that we're very glad to hear that that is happening and, and that's good. And we want to see that continue to happen going into the future. Um, then it comes to now the negative part, I'm afraid. There always is a negative part as well. Um, uh, I know that um, through reading through your, your brief and from what you were saying there today, um, the, the budget and the 50 to 60 per cent of, of your budget goes on staff costs. And you've talked about there about the possible redundancies. Um, I suppose it's just to ask, out of those redundancies, do you see that, will they be voluntary redundancies? Will they be enforced redundancies? Do you still have staff that are on furlough or on the new scheme that has been um, put forward by the government. Um, so it's just really the first part of my question is just to ask you about your staffing issues. Sure, um, let me just uh, 
uh, begin to try and answer your question around that. Obviously, local government finance is a very complex issue and each council is in a very different position. And again, the furlough scheme was, was something that was of great benefit to us. And if you think about how we've tried to reopen our services and maximise the income that we've got from furlough, it has been a very fine balancing act. Um, and we're still waiting for guidance in relation to the new scheme because obviously the furlough scheme finishes at the end of October. I suppose clearly for each council, um, we're four months away from striking the rate. Um, we're, we're trying to engage in a lot of planning with our elected members about our financial positions. So there is a lot of uncertainty, is, is what I would say. Um, on the one hand, um, uh, it, it's very unacceptable to our businesses and our residents to increase the rates within the current circumstances. Um, and at the same time, as Suzanne said, 50 to 60% of our costs relate to our staff so clearly we're all embarking on efficiency regimes um, clearly as well um, where, where it comes to staff uh, uh, staff costs that we want to, to save chair we will want to do that initially through a voluntary severance program and these programs take quite a bit of time to put in place and I think um, you and your colleagues would be aware of that so to get a policy in place to consult with the trade unions to talk to the staff to get their commitment to voluntary severance sometimes can take up to six months so it's a very um, moving and evolving process I don't think anybody in any any council could fully answer your question at this moment in time, Chair. But I think what we do need to do um, is engage more fully, um, given the urgency of what we're facing in four months' time, and hopefully get the delay um, to that timetable and give time, as Suzanne said, to allow us to plan and engage fully um, with our colleagues in central government to try and address those issues. So that probably doesn't answer your question fully. I do have two finance colleagues um, with us today who also might want to um, comment on that. So we'll have Alfie Dallas from Derry City and Straban uh, Council and we also have JJ Tohill from Mid Ulster but I think Alfie might be more aware of some of the detail around that if you'd like um, to hear from him as well this morning Chair. Yep, go ahead Alfie. Yeah I suppose it's just in relation to the furlough scheme just providing some further clarity. At the peak of the scheme I think we had over 2,000 staff across local government in Northern Ireland on furlough obviously that figure is moving now in a way Places. And even, you know, over the last week with localised lockdowns and whatever, we're looking, you know, at the potential of staff going back on furlough. Um, so the new scheme, there's no real certainty around it at present. Um, you know, obviously it'll depend on how our facilities um, c can open. And so we're, we're keeping that under under review. Um so that's, we're happy to provide updated figures on the current furlough, but the scheme is running out at the end of the month, and that's when we're going to see the real benefit of that, you know, uh, coming to an end and, the, uh, you know, more significant issues for councils to consider at that point. Okay, Alfie, thank you. And I suppose then, Jackie, my next question would be related then to what Alfie was saying there as well. I mean, you know that as part of our committee remit, um, we look at uh, the whole issue around the, the arts and culture. And I know certainly in your own council, Jackie, you have three theatres. And mm -hmm. I would imagine that all of the staff that work in them are on furlough at present. And so it's just then again, and I've, I've heard Suzanne, I think, mention there about reclosure of some services that are already open. Um, I mean, my question was to ask you about, uh, you know, when, you know, about the reopening of, of, of our theatres and some other um, parts of, of local council services. Um, so it's just, it's very much linked to that and the furlough as well. And, you know, that's what we, we, I certainly worry about those staff. Yes. Um, because we are going to need that again and hopefully not in the too distant future we will see that uh, if there's some sort of art strategy comes into place um, so it's just about asking about reopening of some things and what do you envisage you're going to have to close again you talked about discretionary services <coughs> you could just give a few examples to the committee of what discretionary services are Okay, uh, Chair, again, uh, I'll maybe kick off and Suzanne may want to elaborate again. I suppose the whole context in terms of how we're trying to reopen and manage our, our services and the health and safety and well-being of our staff and our customers 
we're just surrounded with uncertainty. So I suppose within local government, we do have a limited um, offering in terms of how we've reopened our leisure centres. But obviously, social distancing means that we have a limited number of customers. And obviously, that further impacts on the income that we can generate. I suppose in relation to um, theatres, yes, Chair, as you say, we have three theatres in Antrim and Newton Abbey. Um, we would hope to be able to avail of what uh, the new scheme that will replace furlough um, with regards to those staff. But with social distancing um, and the impact in terms of the number of customers that we will potentially be able to have in our theatres when we reopen them, when we balance that against the cost of actually putting production on, you know, again, difficult decisions will have to be made by our local elected uh, representatives as to how we manage that within the context of the, the ongoing financial situation that we've just talked about. So there is a lot of uncertainty. Um, we know that there has been some funding uh, recently agreed for the arts and culture sector and again we did have some engagement with um, some of the officials from the department around that on Friday so you know we look forward to more details around that. Um, uh, Suzanne, do you want to say anything more about reopening and, and the pressures from an op operational point of view? Yes, thank you very much, um, Jackie and Chair. Um, I'm obviously hoping that we don't have to reopen anything that we've re reopened, um, but of course we just don't know what we're, we're heading into. And obviously we've, we've opened as many of our leisure facilities, for example, as we have. Um, across um, uh, the board, um, and uh, and you, you asked, and we, we don't want to be facing um, somewhere we have to, to close those again. And uh, obviously, we have a lot of those staff in furlough, and we brought many of those staff back in of furlough. Um, and uh, without knowing the detail of the new scheme and how that will impact on us, uh, it's very difficult to, to really plan for that at the minute. So, we need that guidance um, around the new scheme. My understanding is that um, staff. Um, We'll have to work so many hours a week. That's not always suitable for the type of staff that, that we maybe have on the furlough. So I think it's going to be a terribly complex um, operation for us to, to um, try and protect people as much as possible. Because like you, um, I absolutely um, worry about staff. If I turn to some of the cultural venues, you know, like the Hall, and um, like uh, the um, ICC um, or Waterfront, as, as you may all know it, um, in Belfast as well. Um, clearly, quite a few of those staff um, are in Inferno, uh, and um, because those premises have not opened um, again, and we haven't opened our doors at City Hall with our um, cultural activities that we um, would have here, and then that impacts on catering, etc. too. So those staff are in Inferno as well. Um, so um, we do have real concerns about the end of the scene and what that will, will mean. Um, and also we would have a number of casual staff as well as permanent staff um, who would um, uh, uh, help and assist in those, those operations. Um, so uh, we want to treat you know everybody as fairly as we, we can. So I, I see that as the most urgent thing that we now have to, to, to look at. Um, as local government in terms of our um, em employer responsibilities um, and we need to be doing that in the next few few days. We haven't got all the answers yet because we need to sit down with, with that guidance and work our way through it. Um, in terms of cultural venues, you know, we are concerned about those um, and um, I'm clearly we're watching what's happened in other places um, about them uh, either not being allowed to open as planned or being you know, closed back down again. So um, it is a major worry. Um, for us, um, and of course, we, we're working with your department in supporting the whole of the, the cultural sector as much as we possibly can um, during this period. And, and the money that was announced um, is very welcome for that sector. Okay, thank you. Before I open up to members, I just want to ask one more thing, and that is to do with um, the rates. Um, you, every time I hear estimated penny product, I, I just <laughs> takes me right back to my those days in council. It, those long, long meetings, those many long meetings, um, sitting in the chamber, um, looking at the rates, sending the, the staff back and saying, no, cut that by another half percent, and then cut that again by another half percent. And I know how difficult, you know, those years I sat in council, how difficult that was to get our rates down to the very lowest that we could get them. Um, so it's just to ask you, uh, uh, Jackie, then as well, about Anne Suzanne. Um, about uh, any conversations that you've had about protecting um, the estimated penny product and, and delining the rates. Um, just what conversations are you having with the Department of Finance on that as well? 
Um, and I, I, again, I, I would, I'm sure I could speak for all of the committee. If there's anything that we can do, if the committee needs to write through to either our own minister or the minister for finance, we'd be more than happy to do that. So, if you could just uh, maybe answer that one for me as well. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, the engagement, I have to say, has been um, really positive. So I suppose the most re recent engagement was with the ministers through the partnership panel, and those issues were raised and discussed freely. Um, the finance minister also recently attended a, an executive meeting of NILGA, and the issue was discussed uh, at great length then as well. And I suppose in relation to the permanent secretaries, again, I would have to put on record, you know, in all the years I've worked in local government, the engagement um, with your team of permanent secretaries and the staff um, that work for them has never been better. And I think it is important to say that. And we have been going through a really difficult time. So, you know, that is, is really appreciated, I think, um, by both parties. Um, so, yeah, quite recently I had a meeting um, with the two relevant permanent secretaries and it has been discussed um, and obviously the um, permanent secretaries and the ministers have said they will take it away and they'll come back to us. Um, as Suzanne uh, alluded to earlier, the partnership panel have asked that there would be a task and finish group set up to look at some short-term issues that are more urgent and I think you know we've discussed those this morning in terms of the we ha us having to strike the rate within four months and what we can do to help councils to plan for that and potentially even delay it. So those conversations have been had, um, Chair. And I have to say that as a sector, you know, we do believe that we are receiving all of the support um, and all of the engagement that we've asked for. Um, and I suppose, again, that reflects uh, the recognition that we feel that we have with the, the, the various ministers and the permanent secretaries in terms of the role that the councils are playing and, and the role and the, the importance, I suppose, of local democracy within the current context of the ongoing pandemic. But I'm sure Suzanne will want to add to that as well. Thank you, Chair, just to um, uh, re reiterate some of what Jackie has um, said. In terms of um, the pace at which we have to, to solve some of these issues, um, I think that course we're all dealing and grappling with what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis at, the, at this point in time um, and the here and now and it's sometimes quite hard to put the time and effort into thinking even four months down the road um, never mind for the next two years at this point in time when it comes to financing um, but given the dependency of local government um, on the rate base um, I don't think we can wait um, to do this and of course you know, this task and finish group and needs to get up and running very, very quickly, um, with only four months within which to work for um, uh, setting the rate for, for next year. Um, so I think that the committee could help in terms of the urgency um, and uh, the need to do that and why that needs to happen, um, articulating that effectively um, for us, and um, because it's really about sustainability with the government and protecting local uh, democracy um, going forward. Um, and it's not just about us saying we, you know, um, we don't want to face cuts because we know we have to. Um, so that's what's really at stake. So I think it could really help with that. I also think that um, there obviously is this discussion about a new model, model for um, rates uh, and also you know, how we will find out for local government in the future in a more sustainable way. That's going to take a lot of time to work through that. Um, so really, we're sitting probably at, at more than two years old. So really, in the meantime, once we work through that process, we are saying that for the next two years, uh, can the money be found ring fenced um, to? Suzanne, we've lost you. Through the rate Thank you. All right, Suzanne, we kind of lost you near the end of there. Your sound quality is not brilliant right. today. But um, we, okay. so if you can go, we got you. We got you there finally at the end. Again, we lost a little bit. Um, look, that, uh, members, that's me finished for now. I do have a few more questions, but I'm going to open up to the floor. Um, I have Fran, I have Kelly, and then I'll go to Johnny and ask him. Does any other member want to come in? Okay, thank you. Fran, do you want to go ahead first? Chair, sure, I want to uh, thank uh, people for the the certainly the the, the paper they provided here this morning. Their evidence it's it's, it's very helpful. Uh, although the, the two different parts of the paper impact on communities uh, paints up a very devastating uh, picture of uh, what, what, what could happen. You know, 
uh, even one of them, or one element of it, and I'm just looking at it, remember, back in the days of Belfast City Council, uh, minimal maintenance at parks and open spaces uh, could lead to huge costs somewhere down, uh, down the lane, but as important to that as uh, the impact on street cleans and weight collection, disposal arrangements, and the support for uh, local local communities, and uh, you, you always think that these things have to be protected at, at all costs. But along with that, uh, you have to uh, think and consider the impact uh, that any type of redundancy would have on families out there who totally depend on uh, the council for mortgages and for for for, for running run, run costs. Uh, but. Uh, 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 and then you go down and the, 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 the talk about the support requested and it talks about uh, uh, LPS, LPS to work with the council to develop a robust rates for forecasting model. Has the council already started that? Are they looking, uh, we're talking here today, four months as a blink of an eye away. Uh, as part of that forecasting, has the council's got an idea of what their ask is, what their expectation is, of government, and uh, to follow up on that, do you see the route through that? Is the, the, the partnership panel that the minister has set up, and uh, w that that offers an opportunity to all the uh, the, the, the the ministers and organisations and councils that, that that have an interest in us? Yeah, um, no, that's a, that's a very good question. And I suppose, yes, you've mentioned the partnership panel. I do think that the partnership panel and that political leadership is extremely important in terms of how we work our way through this. I think as officers, you know, we can provide a lot of information and a lot of data and a lot of expertise. And I think I've said before, local government finance is very complex and it's very different in Belfast City Council as to what it would be in Antrim and Newton Abbey. So yeah, we do need that political leadership through the partnership panel and as I say the engagement to date has been very positive and we are confident that if we continue that engagement we can work our way through this process. Um, you've also pointed out the, um, I suppose, the essential services and the statutory services that we all provide and of course um, there are other things that are maybe more discretionary for councils and without the things that Suzanne articulated very well and I'm sure she'll want to come in and, and comment on this again. Without that then local politicians will have very tough decisions to make and there'll be decisions that they will not want to make. So we're, I suppose I'm quite positive and confident based on the experience that we've had with uh, at a political level and at an officer level to date that we can work our way through this um, and obviously what we're here to do today is just to try and ob obtain your support in terms of the process moving forward over the short term over the next four months but also into the future and beyond in terms of the more sustainable model that Suzanne alluded to and I'm sure Suzanne would like to comment on that as well. Um, thank you, Jackie. I think um, you have uh, you've just outlined really the, the difficulty and the choices that are going to face local government unless we get this this level of protection um, from the rate. Um, because you know our discretionary services are things like, um, for example, um, uh, you know our outreach into communities, um, our work on fuel poverty um, that uh, we do, our work on skills development that we do in communities, um, trying to, to reach those furthest from. Uh, the labour market, um, for example, um, our work on cultural activities, those are all discretionary services. And of course, um, what councillors then are going to be faced with if they don't have a base budget is, am I going to make this person redundant or these people redundant? Um, am I going to continue these services? Um, I'm not going to be able to invest in anything for the future either. So what what, what an awful situation um, to be faced with because, uh, as you know yourselves, because many of you have been in local government before, um, local government is all about delivery. It is all about, it's very close to its citizens and it's all about getting out there and meeting their needs and being as flexible as possible. And what, what we would really um, uh, hate to see is that we deliver only our statutory services, which are collecting the bins, which are burying people um, and uh, which are carrying out our regulatory services. And that, that's, you know, the stark um, consequences of the decisions we would have to make if we don't have this protected. I think the partnership panel, um, just to, to touch on that, as long as it continues to be supported by all the ministers um, and 
that well, um, it will it, it will work effectively. Um, I also think that we, we you know um, have to have more detailed conversations um, with um, individual uh, committees and individual ministers, just like we're doing um, today as well, um, to get into the detail of some of those things and, and setting up task and finish groups, etc., is a really good way um, of doing that as long as they're. You know, it seems urgent. They're driven forward, and they come back um, in very short order with their recommendations. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for for, for, for those answers. Uh, but another element of of council planning uh, for the past number of years has been the whole uh, city deals and uh, how you move that forward. And for other councils, uh, all of them have their different way of approaching this and and how they create the economic development, community development within uh, their, their 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 own areas. Uh, how will this impact on that there? Because there was so much uh, 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 put into uh, coming up with a plan that was to take each area maybe 10, 20 years down, down the line. Will that be seriously impacted on, especially in the match funding and, uh, and, uh, and stuff like that? And you also you talk about a, a co-design uh, of a new model of financing for local government. Uh, could you give us some insight into uh, how you see that moving forward? Again, uh, briefly, because um, I know Suzanne will want to get into the detail on some of this. I think um, in terms of city deals, each council uh, is probably going to deal with that quite differently depending on the projects and their ability to raise revenue and the ability to capitalise revenue. So there's a complexity there. In relation to the co-design of a future model, I think we all recognise that that will take a little bit of time. Um, I think we probably need to look to other jurisdictions for other models because essentially, uh, I suppose the rates in a sense are a property tax. Um, so I suppose looking at other models um, outside of our jurisdiction might be a way to start that conversation. Um, but I think it'll be quite a lengthy conversation. And I think as Suzanne um, said earlier, it might take two years to, to come to a conclusion on that. Um, so I suppose there's two pieces in terms of the work that we want to do through the partnership panel. There's a short term piece in terms of where we get to um, next February or hopefully slightly beyond that. And then there's a longer term conversation about the more sustainable uh, financial model. Um, Suzanne, you probably want to comment on city deals, particularly because Belfast is such a, a huge stakeholder in that process in the, the Belfast city region. Well, and most of the city deals will, will work in the same way. So um, clearly some of the money comes from Westminster, some of it comes from the executive and, and some of it comes from uh, local government. So it's a joint financing um, model. So we look on the local government side of things, just to take the Belfast region city deal, for example, it's 100 million um, that's going to be invested over a 10 year period um, by uh, the um, six councils involved in that particular deal. Um, and they have been putting money into the rate they it so far. Um, so, for example, in Belfast, we increased um, our, our rate uh, last year by a small percentage to then finance over a 10 year period um, the projects um, that are going to be in this particular deal. And the same for uh, the other authorities um, around the table. Um, we expected that we would continue to do that and continue to have a very small incremental increase to continue to pay for those um, capital projects that are going to be brought, brought forward. But of course, if then councils are faced with this decision, um, am I going to continue to do that? Um, and that means a small, in, small increase in the rate. Is that, is that um, something which is acceptable to business or not? Uh, um, and um, if, uh, but uh, on the other hand, I might have to make some people redundant. Um, you know, where are they going to to um, uh, come down on in terms of uh, that particular incredibly difficult um, decision? So um, it just comes back again to the case that we're making. Um, local government, not just from a year-to-year -year basis. Um, yes, paying for services is on a year-to-year -year basis, but in terms of those big projects like City Deal, we're doing that over a 10-year period. So if we don't protect the key area of our income, which is the rate base, then you know some of those some of those projects um, uh, certainly could be at risk. Um, and you talked about LPS, and you talked about the rates model. Um, Going on us again, Suzanne. Have a gone, right? Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I can. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. 
Great, great. So clearly the income um, that uh, comes from uh, the property taxes um, in to local government, um, if, if, if we go for a new model, then that has to be replaced by something else. Uh, the executive has to be replaced by something else um, and that's difficult and that's why we need to have this joined up um, working group to look at what this might look like going forward it won't be solved overnight um, but there are definitely our models as Jackie says from other places that we can look at and yes we have started to work with LPS but again we need to, to, to ramp that up in terms of pace um, because if we're asking for this protection um, uh, for the next two years, will that money have to be falling from somewhere within the executive's budget? So that we understand that that is a big ask, um, but we think the risks associated with not doing it are so, so much greater. Thank you. Okay, Fred. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got Kelly, Johnny, Robin, and then Mark. So, Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you all for um, your presentation today. Um, it seems to be that we see you whenever there's there's such a, a pressure on all of you, and, and thank you to all the councils for delivering what you have done so far. And of, of course, we want to support you as far as we can um, in going forward. After all, everyone around this room pays rates, and, and, and everyone you know across the country is, is waiting with bated breath to see what the rates are going to be next year. Um, but I'm just concerned... Um, I'm the sort of person who, whenever somebody's asking me to pay for something, I want to see the value of it. And while you've talked about the partnership panel, I'm just wondering how much are councils able, I know there's a le a local elected rep representatives there, but so far it feels like the community itself, the citizens out there, the residents in your different councils are not fully aware of the impact that this could have. And I'm wondering how soon and how much um, work is being done on the ground to make people aware. Like, for instance, when those tough decisions are being made, there's no point in any councillor or any of us wanting vanity projects there or things that we want to take forward. Um, there will have to be tough decisions. But if we let the citizens know what those decisions are, they can help us and make it easier to make those tough decisions. How much communication is happening then with residents at the moment? Okay, um, again, that's a really good question, Kelly. And suppose, really, if you look at um, the governance model that we have within local, within local councils and our elected mem members, it's such a fantastic example as how local democracy actually works in action on the ground. So the engagement that we have had with our communities um, since the start of the pandemic and the response that they have given in relation to all of this has been absolutely amazing. You know, one concern that I might have and with regards to that is whether or not they can sustain that moving forward. So maybe come back to that point another day. Um, so it's, we really rely on our local councillors, of which we have 40 in my council, and they are very much tuned in to the needs of their residents. They're fully engaged with them. They're having these conversations day and daily. Um, so, you know, I can assure you 100% that whatever decisions the, our local representatives take within the council chamber, they are very tuned in to the needs of their residents. And, you know, the balance for them will always be whether they're talking to a local business or a community group or a resident about um, a particular issue, the balance is always going to be, okay, so we're paying X amount in our rates. What are we getting for that? And if there is going to be an increase, what is the reason for that? Because at the end of the day, local councillors, um, most of them will have to go for re-election at the next council election. So um, you'll know yourself that they're fully engaged with their stakeholders on, on all of these issues, and they'll be very mindful of that when they make the decisions. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, but it's, it's even wider because there have been these local development plan um, consultations mm -hmm. going on for some time, and the public thought on before COVID, you know, there was this bells and whistles proposals coming out, and there was wonderful things due to happen. That's basically on hold now. As Suzanne says, there will be long-term activities which councils will be investing in, but my concern will be that... Our communities have come through, we've all come through a horrendous period of time and are still in it, <clears throat> and then they're going to be faced with a hike in the rates, and I absolutely agree with you, and I think, to be honest, everybody agrees that we need to have multi-year budgets in order to protect and project um, what we need to do going forward and coming out of this, but I think we need to bring our residents with us. Um, it's more than a case of the rates are going up because it's 
our rates can go up in this way because this service will be provided or the rates can go up in this way and this is the different services we can afford to provide. I think it's bringing people with us because they came with us throughout COVID and councils led so strongly through the food parcels and through all of that help and I think that the communities trust and I don't want that trust to be lost but just thinking about those tough decisions then on the partnership panel how much information will be able to be shared with the public about the work of that panel and the work about the different task force about the decisions that are, are being made and how soon will we be able to notify people of the potential rate increase because we do have businesses that are going to the wall and if they're struggling on and on and on to try and keep going and then they find come April that they're faced with a 25% rate, you know, it, it's it's breaking point for, for businesses and then they have to start their redundancy. Um, I'm just wondering how soon we will be able to let people know. I know that there's time yet and decisions have to be taken, but how soon can we let people know? Is this a horrible Christmas present for people? <laughs> I suppose, um, you know, Kelly, that's the reason why we're asking for the delay in the council decision around the rates, because I think the worst thing that could happen is that the councils work really, really hard, as we have done in previous years, to try and really minimise our rates increase. Um, you know, and we publicise that and, you know, that information's out there for businesses and our residents, but they're still not clear about what's going to happen with the regional rate, which, which you know, comes later. So it'd be really good if we could join that up so that, as you say, our residents and our businesses have absolute certainty about what they're facing. And we can also have some choreography around the messaging in relation to that as well. Um, so it is about managing expectations for me. It is about trying to buy as much time as we can get for the partnership panel to have those conversations and to do that planning because we're only at the very, very start of that process um, and who knows how long it's going to take. I mean, obviously, we're trying to stress the urgency of it, but we do, we do need to get that working group um, set up as quickly as possible and get that work commencing and, and try and channel all of our energies into this together so that we come out the other side with one clear message and one clear decision for all of our rate payers. Um, Chair, one final question. Thank you very much. Jackie, uh, uh, do you know what? I don't envy the work that you are doing at the moment, but I support you completely in that. But I'm just wondering, opportunities coming out of this, start, I'll leave you with something more positive. Um, have there been any discussions with the Department of Communities about options and opportunities? You guys are experts on the ground in your local area with local businesses, your chambers of commerce. But we know that there will be an increase in redundancies at the end of furlough, and there's likely to be an increase again um, come April, you know, whenever businesses get to the end of that financial year. Is there any options there for you guys to be involved with redundancy clinics and reaching out within the, you know, those who are being unemployed? And is that a potential for a generation of income using your venues, using your staff um, to help with that process? Because it's huge. Yeah, again, certainly, Kelly, even in the past, um, pre-COVID, where we had issues in, you know, Midney, Stantrum, and Newton Abbey in relation to North Hill, etc., councils always step up from a civic leadership point of view and put those arrangements in place with local employers, and that's certainly something that we would be front and centre on as part of our local economic development strategies. And again, I know that Suzanne's leading on uh, an external economic recovery group um, for Solis, so again, Suzanne might want to comment a bit further on that, but absolutely, that's that's part of our civic leadership role, and it's a key, a core part of our economic development strategies locally. Yeah, thank you, um, and good to come in there because we have been doing a lot of work in this area, um, and particularly in, in partnership with DSC. Um, and yes, there are there are some opportunities. Of course, there are. We have many growth sectors that are continuing to grow um, at this point in time, and jobs still being um, created in the um, tech sector, for for example. And many of our city deal projects actually um, are to boost those sectors even further so we have been involved in clinics um right across the board where redundancies have already happened um for example in manufacturing um businesses we, and we will continue to do that um and we have a really really good model in place um, with the department um to do that we're also um looking at some stimulus um projects as well so for example talking yesterday to the permanent secretary about um housing development and retrofit schemes um to um reduce um energy uh, levels and uh, increase energy efficiency and fuel poverty um across the board 
um, and certainly then um, developing skills academies um, for um, uh, people who have been made redundant so that they can do these kind of jobs as well. And we've just worked with the um, Department uh, for the Economy uh, to look at skills academies and reskilling people for digital sector jobs um, too. So there are, there are many of those work streams um, happening um, and uh, you know that there are some positive messages um, as well as the negatives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just say to those finance people, it's very rare that you'll be thanked at this time of the year. I'm sure you're, you're ready for the hills, but um, it is appreciated. I know that you're trying to make every efficiency that you can, and thank you for that. Um, I think that we will try to support, but we've, there's a lot, of, a lot of people looking for money out there. But um, if we lose our councils, the impact in communities that you've contained in your report is, is somewhat sobering. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kelly. I'm going to go to Robin before Johnny, because I know Robin is under a time pressure. So, Robin, if I go to you. Okay, thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome, Team Solas. Is that what it's known as now, Team Solas? Welcome, and, and indeed, it's good, Chair, to hear about the positive reaction they're having from the uh, via the partnership panel. I, I don't think there should be any doubt, Chair, about our support uh, for, for the, this initiative from the councils. I, I don't think that any of the eight points that they have uh, highlighted there where they need the support for uh, are in any doubt other than that they are e essential uh, as we work through this pandemic and, and hopefully come out the other end. I suppose really all, all I'm going to say, Chair, is I think there is, an, there is a partnership that needs to be enhanced, uh, and that's the partnership of the Assembly, the Department for Communities, uh, working in partnership um, for the benefit of, of, of the ratepayers as far as the, the councils are concerned, but indeed as far as the economic health and well-being of the whole economy. And, and I, I don't think there should be any discussion around uh, whether or not we support this. I think we have to support it, we should support it, and I think it's essential that we support it. Okay, thank you, Robin. Thank you for that. Um, Johnny, can I go to you then? Johnny, can you hear us? Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to the Solace team. Uh, I, I'll be brief, as most of the points have been raised. Um, and again, I will concur with what Robin has said there. We all understand the impact that COVID-19 has had on local government. Uh, and again, it's, it's incumbent upon us to step up to the mark to, tr to try and help in any way we can uh, alongside the department. Um, one thing I would ask, and potentially if there is any sort of glimmer of hope from what we've come through for the rate, rate pairs, is that has there been any detailed paper, and I think I asked this the last time Solis briefed us, um, we know that COVID-19 uh, in relation to local government has had a major impact in most uh, lines of services, uh, but has there been any detailed paper to provide to the department regarding any savings that have been made during COVID-19? And I think because of the closure of, of leisure facilities, etc., that there has been some saving which can be then uh, put on uh, and due regard had for whenever it comes to striking that rate. Okay, again, um, a very complex question and I suppose um, quite a complex answer. So in terms of the current financial year, um, obviously we had to close a lot of facilities, which meant that um, you know, we could have been in a position where we, we were continuing to pay all of our staff, but we had no income coming in. But thankfully, in the current financial year, we've had all of the assistance, which we've referred to earlier in our letter, things like furlough, things like um, the support that we got from the department in terms of loss of income. So that has really, I suppose, leveled um, and uh, leveled things out in the current financial year, Johnny. Um, and suppose really that's why we're focusing our conversation on future years, because as we come to the end of furlough and we come to this uncertainty about opening things, and then as Suzanne says, hopefully not having to close things again, but we might have to close things again, not being able to open our theatres, for example, and having to bring those staff back onto either a new job retention scheme or bringing them back and paying 100% of their salary, we're still facing a lot of uncertainty. I suppose 
We've had a lot of help in this financial year, which, as we've said earlier, has kept us solvent. We've been able to keep going. Our big concern is next year because potentially what we're facing next year is an economic downturn. Um, we will not receive as much income as we normally do through the rates, which accounts for 70% of all our income. So if you look at the other 30% in the current climate, it would be difficult for councils to increase their prices, in a sense, in terms of our earned income. So I don't think we can go there. So next year, we're potentially potentially facing a similar scenario where we have reduced usage of our leisure centres with social distancing, but we probably will not be able to reduce our costs that much because, as we've said, our staffing costs are around 50%, 50 or 60% of our total costs. So in a sense, it's a bit of a, a vicious circle, and, and that's why we've detailed the assistance that, that we would hope to get um, centrally in next year and the and in further financial years because it is there's so much uncertainty it's just really really difficult for us to manage but I can assure you that uh, council officers and elected representatives and each councillor are going through our, our budgets with a very fine tooth comb looking at those costs that aren't staff costs that aren't fixed overheads which aren't statutory in a sense and trying to find as much efficiency as we can um, as we are are working our way through the rate setting process um, going now in the middle of February. So I know that's quite a long answer, um, Johnny, and I really appreciate your question. Um, and I'm happy to take any supplementaries. Yeah. No, no, just, just, and I appreciate what you are saying, and I suppose it's not just as clear cut picture as probably some people would expect. Mm -hmm. And I understand even with leisure facilities, etc., and particularly around swimming pools, etc., that you know the running costs don't necessarily de decrease because there's less usage of facility. I understand that from the mm -hmm. time in local government. But one thing I suppose that, that probably bewildered me, and I know a lot of uh, constituents that I would talk to, is the approach that a lot of public sector and indeed the council took to the furlough scheme, given that it was so generous at 80%, uh, and knowing that the savings that they would need to, to, to hold for for the long term, that, that many councils, and I'm not sure all, I, I, think, I can't remember the figure that you suggested the last time that they were at the committee, you know, furloughed their staff at 100%. Um, but that's, that's by and by, that's passed now. But can I, can I ask this question? Um, have councils had difficulty in getting staff back off furlough uh, because this, of the scheme and as, as such being so generous? We, we, we've heard multiple reports of this uh, by our constituents, etc., that a lot of public sector bodies, including councils, are having difficulty now getting their staff back from furlough and into the workplace. Uh, essentially because the scheme has been too generous. Okay, well, I suppose, I think um, Andrew Mead and Abbey Council was probably the only council that didn't top up the furlough scheme, so I, I, I can't comment on the others. And I praise you for doing yeah. that. Yeah, oh, well. So, but I suppose in terms of getting staff back from furlough, my sense of it, uh, Johnny, is that actually, given the uncertainty and given the situation that we're in from the staffing point of view, everybody was delighted and they all wanted to come back from furlough. But I suppose at the same time, we were looking at limited reopening of our facilities, you know, whether was our golf, our leisure centres, community centres, etc. So we weren't able to bring everybody back in a sense. So I suppose it was really applying a judgment in terms of the operational needs of the service and also trying to maximise the amount of um, subsidy that we could get through the furlough process for our staffing costs at that particular moment in time. And I think, as we said earlier, that's changing by the day and by the week in each council. And, uh, you know, it is a challenge for us to manage it, but we will do the best thing for our ratepayers and I suppose from a ratepayers point of view and you know I would receive communications on a regular basis from ratepayers and from other stakeholders, MLAs etc etc. The balance is about um, residents um, paying their rates and then saying to us look you've only got a, a limited offering in your leisure centre so it's a it's a whole balancing act right across the piece in terms of trying to satisfy your customers, trying to satisfy your ratepayers, trying to keep the staff on board, trying to manage the local politics as well. Um, and I think across the piece with the 11 councils, um, things may be operated slightly different just depending on context. And as we said earlier, things have changed up in Derry City and Str Straban Council um, as late as last week. So we're, we're really just doing our best to manage within all of those constraints and all of the challenges that we're facing. 
And okay. could I come in there just to, and uh, the same same here in Belfast in terms of people coming off furlough, we have not experienced any uh, negative issues there at all. Um, and of course, um, the decision to pay 100% was purely a political um, decision. Um, and and you know those are the, again the choices um, that politicians will have to make to balance up. Um, but we're we're now facing into um, a much more difficult scenario where those choices and those balances are, are just going to be um, incredibly difficult um, for them. So I would also just come back on the efficiency issue because on the bids we put into um, the department um, for um, uh, the um, payments of loss of income, um, we netted all of that off with what we had saved in terms of efficiencies. So that information is there. It'd be very, very easy, I think, for us to compile that into a couple of pages for you um, so that you can articulate that when you're asked questions about, oh, well, what, what are councils doing themselves um, to make efficiencies? So we can provide that um, after this committee. Okay, that, that's fine. And, and sure, I'll, I'll leave it there, but can I just put on record my, my thanks uh, to those that have contributed? And indeed, you know, I, I did read when a time whenever there was a lot of negative headlines regarding uh, COVID-19. I, I did read that uh, Jackie Dixon, Chief Executive of Antrim and Newton Abbey, had taken a voluntary pay cut amid plans for dozens of staff redundancy and the financial pressures of COVID-19. And I just want to say I think that demonstrated real leadership and uh, I would like to, to thank you for the work that you've done throughout COVID-19. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Um, who are we going to next? I'm going to Mark next. Mark, are you there? Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, everyone. I thought we, I thought they were nearly going to get to me without my questions going to be asked, but then Johnny uh, sort of majored on the staff end of things and, and the furlough side of things. So he that might not have asked exactly what I was going to ask, but I think <laughs> the answers touched on the answers that I might have been uh, looking for. I would be uh, extremely anxious about the end. A furlough, and I wonder if, if, if uh, Solace as a group have made any representation. I know different parties are. I know now the finance minister has and the executive are making representation uh, to the, the, the Treasury about the importance of extending furlough, you know, so that we don't hit this cliff edge uh, at, at the end of the month. I, I think there, there might be some merit in local government doing that collectively uh, uh, as well. Because, of course, when further we end, we have got sight of this new job support scheme. And I think Alfie referred to it slightly uh, earlier on. But uh, like it took me about an hour to understand how that is meant to work. And now I still can't understand how it can possibly work. <laughs> uh, but either way, councils won't be eligible for it. It's just small and, and medium-sized businesses. So you, yous are kind of left really in the lurch now. There's also an issue, I suppose, with the, the end of, of furlough or on the staff side of things. I was going to ask, has there been, has staff sickness been much of an issue uh, to date? And if not, I think it's fair enough to surmise that it is going to be because this uh, virus is everywhere and every day we're hearing of new positive cases. I know uh, councils will have taken the steps uh, since since the outbreak in, in March and since lockdown where if people can be working from home, they will be working from home, but that's not possible in a lot of uh, the functions that council perform and, and, and even those statutory functions that you referred to, Suzanne, I wonder, are councils confident that they have the capacity to uh, with, withhold or, or you know, they maintain services in the circumstances where there might be an outbreak and your bin crew or whatever, uh, or cemetery workers, they're just, that workforce is completely depleted or decimated because of an outbreak? Okay. Um, just briefly again, I'll hand over to Suzanne in relation to engagement. Uh, I know, yes, there's been a lot of engagement around the furlough scheme and I know that Nilga in particular have been engaging really heavily with the Treasury on a whole raft of issues. So, But if there's anything more that we can do, we're obviously happy to, to take that on board. 
Um, the job support scheme, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty around and we are awaiting guidance. I think initially with the furlough scheme, if we recall, we were initially unsure as to whether councils yep. would be eligible and then we were able to clarify that again with a lot of pressure. So we may have to do the same thing again. Um, we're just not sure yet. I suppose anecdotally in relation to staff absence, again, I can only speak to my council staff, staff absence levels are uh, reduced significantly. But I suppose that's because we have had a high level of staff on furlough. We've had people self-isolating, a lot of people working from home, apart from those people that you've clearly identified who have been on the front line uh, day and daily since the start of this pandemic. And I think we'll have to pay tribute to them as well, because there was a lot of fear out there at the very start. And I think we've all forgotten about that. So we need to reflect on that. We have had scenarios in our council um, in parks and cemeteries and other frontline services where we've had to manage outbreaks and teams having to go and self-isolate. And I suppose the, the work that we did at the start um, to prepare for that was we had a lot of our leisure um, staff initially who obviously were being furloughed and even pre-furlough, but weren't sure exactly what to do with them. And I have to say, again, I pay tribute to them. A lot of them put their hands up and said, we will do anything. So I had leisure staff working in cemeteries. I had leisure staff reopening household recycling centres. I had leisure staff delivering food boxes. Those guys volunteered and actually the feedback that I've had from them is that it was a fantastic experience for them and in fact really good to get that experience right across the council in terms of their future careers as well. So again, just, just to give you some of that anecdotal experience. Um, Suzanne, I don't know if you've had any specific um, plans or experience of having any outbreaks in any of your frontline teams. Um some um just just now at this point in time um we have but of course we've done the same as jackie we've tried to protect um those teams as much as we possibly can in terms of um, social distancing and perspex and etc but also um in terms of how we rotate the teams um and then we've trained up other people um as well um to, so that we can bring them in if necessary so for example take the crematorium which is for all of northern ireland and we had a very small staff um uh, staffing um, ratio there but we brought in uh, many other people from other services to help us with that and we can continue to do that as things happen but I am I, I must admit I am with you Mark on this I am concerned um, because clearly um, the guidance is you know if somebody tests positive then everybody else um, right. to isolate and then um, you know and you could get um, you, you know, a, a circle of that happening for quite, quite a considerable period of time. So I am concerned about the impact that it has on um, those online services, and I think we will see some of that hitting us over the next number of months, despite the fact that we're doing everything that we possibly can to protect them and keep teams going <laughs> to replace them. Um, but I think we have to realise that that is, is coming. On the furlough side of things, I am just as concerned as you too. Um, we need that clarity on whether local government can avail of this new scheme um, and also then what it will mean and I know your reading of it is that we, we can't so we need to, to understand that very clearly um, when I'm not sure way, if you would even if you could because it, it, it's just well, well, I know, I know, and um, uh, so that's a difficulty. But when further ends, we have still got you know a significant number of staff and a lot of casual staff who are on furlough that have no job to go back to um, at this point in time because that that particular part of the organisation is not yeah. running because it's income generating and it's not open. So what on earth do we do um, in that particular situation? Because we don't want to make people. Um, redundant. So it's a really urgent issue. So, I mean, and as I said earlier, this, this for me is the, the, the most critical issue for here and now that we get this resolved. Okay, uh, thank you, Jackie, and, and thank you, Suzanne. And it was remiss of me, I suppose, at the start of my remarks, not to commend the work and commend the work of councils and council uh, staff throughout the, the, this whole situation. I should have declared an interest as well and in that, that my wife is, is a council employee. But, but I think what we really do need to be looking, and it's hard to do, like it's an unprecedented situation, but it's also an extremely unpredictable one mm -hmm. <laughs> for, all of, for, all of, for all of us, but uh, especially for all of you when you have responsibility, not just for so many employees, but for so many citizens in each of your uh, respective uh, council areas and given the unpredictability of it and we don't know 
walks around the next corner. It's difficult to plan ahead for next year, but that's what we need to be doing. <laughs> and the thing that we need to be doing is the thing that's most difficult to do. So I, I don't know how we get our heads around that, but I do think it, it, it's vitally important that there's continuous engagement. And I'm, I'm glad to hear, I'm not surprised to hear, but I'm glad to hear of the ongoing engagement with other departments as well. I think that is vital and it's vital, I suppose, that we know then that all departments are working together alongside councils because uh, if ever it was needed, it's needed now. But uh, thank you for that, anyway. Okay, thank you, thank you Mark. Right. And then I'll move on to Sinead. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I want to thank uh, Guys and Solis for, for your time today. And I don't underestimate uh, the challenges that local government uh, is facing in the time ahead. Um, I suppose I have a couple of points um, I just want to make. Uh, and firstly, I know we, there was a bit of, we spoke a bit, a bit there about salaries. Um, and I know some councils, um, particularly in Uri Morning Down, have undertaken a review of their management structures and um, have uh, it's well underway, if not probably almost complete, um, in terms of, of cost saving and, and things like that. And I wonder, has any other council done similarly in, in terms of their management structures and, and trimming some of the fat there? Um, I suppose, secondly, um, and it probably goes back to what Fra was saying in terms of um, the uncertainties and the fact that we're talking about estimates here. And I suppose Department for Finance can't guarantee an estimation of losses. So I suppose the sooner we know the figure um, that we're talking about here, the better. Uh, again, like I, I caveat this with the fact that I was a local councillor and I know how difficult the and how agonising the, re the rates uh, set and process can be, but um, some councils have been very bad uh, in the past at financial management um, and that's had a de detrimental impact uh, on their rate uh, set and process in those councils. So I suppose um, you know, I I'd be asking what, what sureties are there for uh, Department for Communities and the Department for Finance that rate protection isn't just to shore up bad financial management in some of those councils. Okay, um, Shanae, I suppose, I suppose in relation to management structures, um, you'll all be aware of the, the process that we went through in 2015 where we had the merger of the councils. And again, I can only speak from my own experience on this, um, but obviously we went through a very comprehensive process in terms of restructuring and offering voluntary severance. And we're going through that process again internally. And I would assume that all councils have done that. Um, I think the elected members and, and all of the councils are, are very mindful of um, just making sure that their structures are as lean as possible, but trying to balance that within the whole um, context of, of voluntary severance at this moment in time, Sinead. I suppose in relation to um, assurances around um, council finances, again, you know, we all have our audit committees with independent members on our audit committees. We have our accounts that are audited. We have uh, reports that come to those charged by governance as a whole raft of controls in there, both internally and externally. So, um, you know, I, I would assume that the two departments, the uh, Department for Communities and Department of Finance, would be looking towards those as part of their due diligence process. But again, if, if, um, if colleagues feel that's something that we should be exploring in partnership or collectively, I think, you know, we'd be more than happy to engage in that conversation or in some type of process around that in terms of governance. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yep. Thanks. Okay. All right. That's all members who have asked to speak have spoken. Um, I just want to just finish off. I want to say thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I didn't say it at the very beginning about um, the work that councils have done over this, this period. Um, it has been phenomenal. I've seen it in my own area. I've seen it with, I mean, I cover my area is Belfast City Council and Antrim and Newton Abbey. So I have both of my chief executives on solace, so it's really very good. <laughs> I know, so we probably have a little bit biased there as well. Um, so uh, yeah, I've, I've seen wonderful delivery. I've seen great work, and I've seen I've actually seen a lot of, of councillors across all of the parties as well um, change in many ways and do things very differently because they understand um, the financial pressures. And I suppose it's something that Kelly picked on up, up on earlier. And I mean, I am a member of a political party, so I speak to my my. Uh, my my colleagues at council level as well um, regularly and, and you know when we talk about various projects and we know that council during the summer period um, had to scale back greatly 
on the, the amount of services they provided. I mean, I, you know, the, the various um, cultural events that would have happened. And I know we're coming into the Christmas period when we are so used to seeing councils, um, you know, really step up to the mark, make Christmas very special for so many people in our towns and villages and in our cities. Uh, and, you know, and that is all paid for through the repairs. So, I mean, I just imagine that, um, I still, not that I'm saying that we, we have to cancel Christmas because that's <laughs> far from it. Um, but, I mean, I suppose we're going to see, I, I suppose, a different Christmas as well from what we should expect from our local councils. Uh, and it's just that understanding from, from people out there. I mean, I always am a great believer in that old saying that eating bread is quickly forgotten. And, and that sadly does happen. Um, we do it. We do it ourselves, uh, as normal as human. All do it as human beings, and and I suppose we just need that reminder out there to to everyone, whether they're elected members or members of the public. Um, you know that these are harder times and difficult times, and councils are going to have to make some very difficult decisions. Um, I have to be mindful of that. Um, so it's just that to finish on that, and I would imagine um, Jackie and Suzanne certainly we will have you in um, on numerous occasions because I don't think this is ending any time soon. Um, and while we want to see our businesses um, and, and have, have those you know, rate holidays and everything else, we know the effect that is having on our local councils and we know the effect that um, locking down any of those services is having on, on our local councils. Um, so I'd imagine we'll have you in uh, numerous times going into the future. And I suppose then, just to finish off as a committee as well, um, we will certainly then be forwarding on your asks. Um, to our own minister and to, I would say, the Minister of Finance as well, and certainly that issue around marrying up the regional rate and the domestic rate. Um, I think that's extremely important um, in, or, in order for, for councils to be able to set that rate. And that's something, again, that I think we as a committee, I'm sure we'll get agreement on that also, um, that we will we'll put that forward as well. Um, I just want to say a big thank you, Jackie, Suzanne, Alfie and JJ, for your time today. And um, if there's anything further you want to comment on, um, I'll just ask that first, Jackie. Is there anything further you want to comment? Or are you happy no. enough? Just again to thank you and your coll committee colleagues um, for listening today. Um, we think we've had a really constructive engagement this morning and we'd be more than happy, Chair, to come back and talk to the committee at any juncture, any time that you feel is appropriate. Okay, look, thank you again. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank we'll you. see you not too distant future. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, members, we're going to just take a quick break to get set up for our next witnesses coming into the room. So if you just uh, uh, take your ease for a few minutes. Get my charger. All right, members, um, we'll then move on to agenda item seven, which is the pre-legislative departmental briefing on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Members, you'll find this at page 94 of your media packs. And can I welcome Liam Quinn and joining us here in the room today. And we've got Carol Reid, who is joining us on Starleaf. So, uh, Liam, pass over to you. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Um, I intend to cover sort of the background to this and, and a bit of an overview and then what the next steps are. And my colleague, Carol, then will go through the, the detail in the bill. Uh, and then we'll take questions afterwards, if that's okay. So, um, in terms of the background, uh, the Executive agreed to the introduction of this bill last Monday, and, and this is the introduction, uh, the pre-introduction briefing. So, we'll talk about the, sort of the broad principles of the bill and uh, where we go from here in terms of the process. Um, the background of this goes back to 2011, <coughs> when a review of liquor licensing was launched, and several ministers have tried to get this across the line over the last nine years. Um, and Probably the closest we got was 2016, when the bill was near the end of committee stage, uh, when the assembly was dissolved. Now, during that process, um, the committee engaged with all the stakeholders uh, right across the board. And this <coughs> bill that the minister is bringing forward this time, as you probably will, will see, has taken account of a lot of the issues which came up during that uh, evidence session. Um, so the, the bill has changed a bit, and I think it's really changed for the better in that it will make the committee's job a lot easier in scrutinising because most of the concerns from those stakeholders have been taken into account. Um, the, the bill contains a, a, a balanced set of proposals. Um, it's trying to balance the need for control of alcohol, which, which is a, a harmful substance and which uh, has, has caused real difficulties in society, 
uh, against the need for the hospitality industry, which you know um, so, uh, maintains an awful lot of jobs and, and pays a lot in tax revenues, uh, allowing them to trade successfully. Um, so that, that's the balance we're trying to strike. Um, and in, in terms then of, of next steps, um, subject to the agreement of the Speaker, uh, we would be planning to have the first stage uh, on the 19th of October. Um, then you have the, the Halloween recess, so it would be the 3rd of November before we could have the second stage. Um, the second stage will be a, a full debate on the principles of the Bill. Um, and all members will obviously have the opportunity to speak at uh, that point. So following the second stage, uh, the, assuming it passes, of course, the, um, the bill will stand referred to the committee um, and the committee will then take on the role of, of scrutiny, uh, taking evidence from stakeholders um, and then into the clause by clause where we will sit here for, for many hours going hours through all end. the details. So I'm going to be hand over to Carol now, who will go through the, the um, content of the bill. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can, Carol. Go ahead. Yep. Great. So, um, I mean, previously I've given a high-level policy overview um, to the committee, and a number of the clauses in the bill will actually require very little more by way of an explanation, but obviously where there's some that are a lot more complex in, in, in certain areas, I'll provide um, I'll put out the key points from those. So the bill is a medium-sized bill. It has 36 clauses and two schedules, which together then deliver ministers' policy proposals. Um, I'll start with part one of the bill that relates to the amendments to the licensing order, the 1996 order. So clause one is for removal of additional restrictions at Easter. Um, this will apply to all restrictions which currently apply over the Easter weekend, both on and off sales. Um, and it will mean that permitted hours will be the same that weekend as any other weekend throughout the year. Clause 2 for public houses and hotels, further additional hours. A licence holder for a pub or a hotel can go to court and ask for 2am opening up to 104 nights in a year. So in practice, we think this will probably lead to Friday and Saturday nights in, in most of the town and city centres. The PSNI councils and local residents can object to that additional hour um, and the courts can also add conditions. And then on top of that, the courts will have an opportunity to amend or revoke an order for further additional hours should, should the need arise. Clause three then, alignment of closing time for liquor and entertainment. So in a nutshell, really, this ensures that entertainment stops at the end of drinking up time. So if an entertainment license is granted beyond that time, any additional hours that have been granted for that um, premises are invalidated um, and no alcohol can then be sold after 11 p.m. For Clause 4, police authorisations for additional hours, this will see a number of late openings available to smaller pubs, which can't provide food and or entertainment, um, and it will increase from the current 20 to 85. It will also allow larger pubs, which do provide food and entertainment, to apply to the police for a late opening on a night which isn't currently included in their own late opening orders. Um, that, but this will only be on 20 occasions per year, and during during those 20 occasions, they would still have to provide food and or entertainment as normal. So Clause 5, extension of drinking up time, this simply extends the drinking up time from 30 minutes to an hour. And it also provides the power to revert back to 30 minutes by regulations at any point, or at any point in the future. Clause 6, then, for major events, this will add two new articles to the licence and order. The department will be given the power to make an order that designates an event as a major event and then specify the permitted hours for that event. Um, the department will be required to consult with appropriate persons before making an order, um, and the intention here would be to consult with the PSNI local councils and the ligature as MNI before making any decision there. Clause 7 for licensed racetracks and um, Sunday sales, that's pretty self-explanatory. It will allow licensed racetracks to sell alcohol on a Sunday, which they currently can't do. Um, a licensed racetrack is part of the category of a place of public entertainment, so the sale will actually be restricted to 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after the entertainment, and it will only be permitted during the hours of 12, 30 and 10 on those Sundays. Clause 8 then licensed for off sales, and this relates to the local producers of alcoholic drinks, such as beer, cider and spirits. So a new category of license for these premises will be created. Um, a local producer's license, we'll call it that for a minute, will, produce, will permit three things. So it will allow local producers to sell their own products from their own premises for consumption off the premises, and this will include online sales. A sample will be permitted to be provided for consumption on the premises following a tour, and the volume of that sample will be set by regulation. 
It will also allow local producers to sell their own products from certain other licensed premises for consumption off the premises at events such as food and drink fairs. So if you think of um, the BBC Good Food show that was in the, the waterfront hall there a few years back, and again, samples may, pre- may be provided um, in those cases. And finally, it will allow local producers to sell their own products from unlicensed premises for consumption off the premises at events such as food and drink fairs at Ian. Now, a number of conditions must be met for this scenario because it obviously relates to unlicensed premises, um, and this will include receiving approvals from the local senior police officers. Clause 9, then, requirement for off-licence. Uh, this will require that where a sale takes place otherwise than in person, so over the phone, internet, by an app, the place of dispatch of the alcoholic drink must be licensed under the licensing order. Um, it will also require where a delivery driver is not acting on behalf of a licensed premises. Um, so, for example, a taxi driver that's gone, that's gone to make a, a, a collection for somebody, that that delivery has to be made without delay and that they must carry the relevant receipt from the licensed premises along, along with the purchase. Clause 10, then, removal of requirement for children's certificates. This is pretty straightforward. There would no longer be a requirement for a licensed premises to apply to the court and to hold a physical children's certificate, but all the safeguards and conditions relating to under 18s and licensed premises must remain. Clause 11, then, for underage functions. So this will allow the court to make an order saying that a part of a premises is suitable for an underage function. Um, in doing that, the court must be satisfied that the part of the premises is structurally da- adapted for the purpose of actually holding functions in the first place. That appropriate steps have been taken for securing the safety of under 18s at such a function and that under 18s don't have access to any other part of the premises which is used for the sale of alcohol. So the court will then also be able to make an authorization for specific individual functions. Um, This order can specify the hours for the function, but it won't be allowed to go beyond 1 a.m. Alcohol dispensers must be put out of operation and access to any other alcohol, for example, in fridges or behind a bar, anything must be prevented. Um, any over 18s that are on the premises at that time also will not be permitted to buy or consume alcohol at that function and no gaming machines um, will be allowed to be um, in pre- present either. Clause 12 then, private functions. This will allow under 18s to remain on licensed premises beyond the current 9.30pm restriction um, to attend a private function. Um, the public must not have access to that function. The person under the age of 18 must be in the company of a parent or someone with parental or caring responsibility for, the, for that child um, at that time. And at least a main course must be served and that meal can't be consumed at a counter that's being used as a bar. So Clause 13 then, delivery of intoxicating liquor to young persons. This clause amends the licence in order to make it an offence to make a home delivery of alcohol to anyone under the age of 18. Clause 14, restaurants and guest houses. Um, a license holder must display a notice detailing information in respect of the conditions under which alcohol may be sold. The information can be prescribed by regulations and the notice must be displayed in each part of the premises that's set aside for food and drink service and it must be visible to anybody who is wanting to buy alcoholic drinks. Clause 15 then, prohibition on self-service and sales by vending machines. So this basically means that alcoholic drinks that are sold without direct supervision um, will be prohibited. Uh, a power will be included uh, to allow sales by vending machines by regulations in the future for guests in pubs which offer accommodation in hotels and guest houses. Clause 16, restrictions on off-sales drinks promotions in supermarkets. Um, so advertisements of drinks promotions in a supermarket will be restricted to the alcohol display area, so the little area and behind the, the turnstile in, in most supermarkets. Off-sales premises will not be permitted to advertise drink promotions within 200 metres of any off-sales premises, and that distance of 200 metres can be amended in the future if necessary by regulation. Clause 17 then, prohibition of loyalty schemes. That's another self-explanatory one. Loyalty points will not be awarded or redeemed for the purchase of alcoholic drinks. Clause 18 for occasional licences and conditions. So the district commander from a district in which an occasional licence is being sought will be able to go to the court and request that terms and conditions be placed on an occasional licence and then failure to comply with those conditions will be an offence. Clause 19 for code of practice. The department will have the power to approve a code of practice relating to the display, sale or promotion of alcoholic drink. The department must consult with the PSNI before approving a code. Um, and once a code has been approved, a court must be satisfied that an applicant for a licence is aware of their responsibilities under that approved code um, when considering the grant or the transfer of a licence. 
and where a license holder is renewing a license, the court has to be um, satisfied that the license holder has actually been complying with that code. So Clause 20, Body Corporate's change of directors, um, another pretty straightforward one. So a body corporate license holder must notify the court and the police of any change of its directorship within 28 days of that change. Clause 21, removal of exemption for Angus Stewart bidders, and this is really following the removal of a duty exemption for Angus Stewart bidders by HMRC. It will now be included in the definition of intoxicating liquor. Um, it's currently exempt um, and therefore must be only sold in licensed premises. Um, so moving on to part two then of the bill, which amends the registration of clubs order. So clause 22 in relation to sporting clubs. Sporting clubs will be permitted to apply to the police to extend the area of the premises which is registered to supply alcoholic drinks for the purpose of holding a function. So the police can grant an authorization up to six times in any year, and each authorization should last one day. But in exceptional circumstances, if the police decide that, and or sorry, one authorization can last up to five days. Um, and the number of authorizations, so up to the six times, can be amended by regulation um, if necessary going forward. So clauses 23 to 28 of the bill then, um, I've grouped them together. They correspond to earlier clauses relating to similar provisions in the licensed premises. So they make changes for registered clubs and um, similar to licensed premises in respect of the removal of restrictions over Easter weekend, the extension of drinking up time, major events, removal of requirements for children's certificate, underage functions and under 18s at private functions. So they're, they're, all, they're, all, um, they're all similar to what will apply to um, licensed premises. Clause 29 then, young people prohibited from bars. So under 18s will be permitted to stay in the bar area of a sporting club up to 11pm during the summer month. And this is currently set at the 1st of June until the 31st of August. And we'll also be able to attend one award ceremony at any other time of the year. And provision has been made within the bill um, for clubs which hold more than one award ceremony per year. Um, clause 30 then, prohibition on self-service and supply by vending machines. So this clause mirrors the provisions in Clause 5 for licensed premises and prevents the supply um, by any means other than under direct supervision. Clause 31, restrictions relating to advertisement. So registered clubs will now be allowed to advertise a function outside of the club premises, which they currently can't do, provided the advertisement clearly states that only members and guests may attend. Um, Advertisements relating to functions where the proceeds are needed to charitable or benevolent purposes, though, will, will, will remain not subject to, to those conditions or those restrictions. Clause 32, then, Code of Practice. Um, this clause creates similar provisions to Clause 19 for licensed premises and basically allowing the department to, to approve a Code of Practice. And then Part 3 of the bill deals with general, general provisions, so it's interpretation, minor and consequential amendments, repeals, and commencement dates. So in terms of commencement, commencement dates specifically, only provisions relating to Easter at this point in time will be commenced immediately. Um, the intention is that the remaining provisions will come into effect at the common commencement date in October 2021. Uh, but this obviously is subject to the length of time it takes for the bill to complete its legislative passage and ultimately the date it receives for royal assent. So, um, yeah, that's the, the bill in a nutshell. In a nutshell. So, Okay. Pass over to you, Chair, again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Carol, for that. That was uh, that was great. If only whenever we get the bill in our hands, we'll get it so speedily. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask anything because I know whenever we get that lovely blue bill in our hands, that paper form, we will. Um, I'm actually get I'm quite excited about it. So yeah, um, that we'll we'll be able to do our clause by clause, and we'll be able to ask you specifics on every single thing. I would imagine that clause eight will cause a little bit of. Um, conversation in the committee room about the local producers um, uh, so I imagine that will happen I suppose it's just to ask and Fran I will remember this because we sat on committee from 11 to 16 going through um, several ministers and uh, the, the, the licensing bill as it was then and all of the, the witness uh, sessions just really to ask Liam and, and uh, Carl as well um, have there been any um, any further matters highlighted from health? Because I remember at the time, um, the the chief medical officer had a few issues with with some of the stuff that was in previous drafts. Yes, um, the department had consulted back in two thousand and twelve around a, a number of issues which the chief medical officer was quite keen on, um, but the minister decided not to include those in the bill. So, for example, um, one of the proposals was that there would be alcohol only tills in supermarkets which would mean that uh, you would queue up and buy your groceries 
and then you'd have to queue up separately at another till to buy any alcoholic drinks. Um, now, the, the, the supermarkets were obviously very concerned about the impact that would have on people flowing through the, 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 the doing, the, doing their shopping, flowing through the I premises. remember that, and it was only for, for over 18s only, and I remember that argument of, well, what if you had a child with you, so yeah. you had to leave your child at one side, yeah. and, even, yeah, and it just wasn't so, going to work. So it wasn't like going to work. Like this. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so there, yeah, but I mean, no doubt as a committee, whenever we do our, when we are doing our, our clause by clause, and when we are, uh, we will have um, representation from health in again. Well, yes. I mean, one of the other issues too that, that touches on the, the license and order would be minimum unit pricing, um, and our minister has met with Minister Swan to discuss that issue, and health have already publicly said that they intend to consult on on the, the principle of minimum unit pricing and potentially the price as well. Um, so and I remember that was an issue at the time whenever we were discussing it in the previous committee. Remember the young young man that um, had died after the, the the promotion that was on in in Jody the Murphy. waterfront, yeah. Yep. Like, and that was very very timely. And I remember us discussing that about the around the issues of, of minimum pricing. So um, no, I do imagine we'll we'll, we'll have fast and varied. Um, evidence sessions on, on all of this. Um, I, I just want to go back to what um, uh, Carol had mentioned there about the Easter opening. If I heard her right, maybe I didn't, I don't know. So the Easter opening will go ahead before uh, Royal Ascent and stuff? Or no, is that that? I get that wrong. Explain but, but, that again. Very close. Okay. <laughs> it, 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 um, that, that provision, those provisions for both the clubs and the rest of the hospitality would come into effect on the day after Royal Ascent. Right. Okay. So the Minister is quite keen to try and get those provisions in for Easter 2021, if at all possible, just given the way things are with the hospitality industry at, at the moment. It would be a bit of a boost for them if we could give them that long weekend uh, with normal trading hours. So, but, uh, so in order to speed that up, rather than waiting for a separate commencement order, uh, yeah. the order has been drafted, so, or the bill has been drafted in such a way that the day after Royal Assent comes into effect. I know that's good to know. I, I, I kind of had, I, I kind of just thought, was that before Royal Ascent or after? So it was good oh, to no. you clarify that for me. Um, and then just so finally, just to ask, um, with the situation around COVID, and we know our pubs and clubs have suffered greatly, absolutely, through this, and will continue to suffer. Um, have they come back to the department at all, at all with any other easements that they wanted to see that haven't maybe been put in the bill? Or has it? Been, are they pretty much happy with what is I think there? They're pretty much happy, chair. To be honest, I, I mean, the, the big change for them was the removal of all the Easter restrictions and the um, 104 late nights. Uh, the bill in 2016 offered 12 late nights, which was one a month. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're now offering 104, which, as Carol said in her presentation, gives you most weekends yeah. if that's what you want to do. Uh, and Easter is huge. I mean, the, the research they've carried out about the loss of revenue over that weekend, where we have very, very tight restrictions at the moment, uh, it affects the Thursday, the Friday, the Saturday and the Sunday. And, and most people are off then on Monday for the uh, bank holiday. Um, so that's a, a big issue for the, for the trade. And it's a big issue for us, I suppose, as well in our, in our tourism, which we hope to see back in, yeah. in full swing mm -hmm. again, um, if not next year, the year after. And I, I know from being in Belfast and living in, in Greater Belfast, when you do see the amount of tourists, and uh, you kind of just think, and, and that is the feedback. You'll see that in TripAdvisor. You'll see it on the various forums. Then don't go to Belfast over Easter because... You know, you can't do X, Y, and Z. So I do see how it would make a big difference. I think the other thing as well, uh, Chair, just to, to highlight it, uh, they removed the restrictions on Good Friday in the South um, just last year. Okay. Uh, which means that if you're planning a weekend away, you know, Donegal or Dublin may be a lot more attractive over Easter yeah, uh, nowadays us. than it was a few years ago where they were closed completely on Good Friday. No, no, that's that's okay. And I told I, I was determined not to ask you anything about any other clauses, but I am going to ask one. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm saying this to everybody because this is not clause by clause. I know. I'm only just going to ask you one other. And it's to do with the clause. Is it 16? The advertising and local <coughs> display. Um, it's not where it is, yeah. Um, and I understand that in supermarkets, how does that work then if you're um, an independent or, or part of a chain out on your main street and your high street, that your windows are blazing? Oh, no, the, the windows are fine. So the uh, windows but, are fine, it's yeah, just yeah. anything outside the window can't be put out. So any A-boards or things like that placed in the pavement. 
I'm not going to ask you another question on any of the causes <laughs> after that. Um, I'm going to move on. Frag, you were you had your hand up first. Sure, I'll I, I, be brief. So. <laughs> No, I think that you, you, you've touched on, on, on quite a lot of it, and just uh, on the whole uh, issue about Easter. Uh, you know, it makes sense because many of the laws that we're dealing with are outdated, and uh, it, it, it would have a huge impact uh, on tourism uh, across, across the board. And uh, I'm just, I can just picture, you know, with it, a single stall for ban alcohol in supermarkets. You could have a two mile lane. Oh. See for groceries, two mile <laughs> lane for, <laughs> for alcohol. Uh, but in, in, in terms of the uh, the the time lane, I know we've probably discussed this about six times every time it's come got close to it. Uh, is there a time lane for when this uh, user estimated that this uh, could go and complete it? Uh, to the assembly and be introduced, does it? Well, I mean, the, whenever we get past the first two stages, um, it'll be up to the committee. Yeah. So, it's, the, really, the ball is in your court after that. Yeah, you can take as long or as short as you want. So, no and in terms of the, uh, and it may have been last a couple of weeks ago, uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, the people who responded uh, to the thing, the, the, the Equal out, equal well, and I, I, I haven't got the, the results of the consultation with me, but of course, you know, a consultation isn't really a referendum. It's, yeah. it's the people who have an interest tend to go and seek out the, 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 the consultation and respond. Mm. Some people only respond to bits that they're particularly interested in. So if you have um, strong religious views, uh, you may seek out that consultation and say, I'm very much opposed to mm. Easter, any changes to Easter. But you may not complete the rest of the, the uh, consultation document. So a consultation document really is about gathering the views and, and the evidence from, from people. Uh, and then we try to go through that and pick out maybe bits that we weren't aware of or explore further with the individuals. But uh, although we always publish the, the figures and the percentages, it's not really that different. But it's not a representative sample. I think we found that when we looked at the gambling consultation yeah. as well. Yeah. The gambling was very much like that because yeah. the, the, the sports clubs were uh, responded in great numbers because they were very interested in local lotteries, but they didn't have any views at all on casinos or bookmakers opening or other issues around gambling. So yeah, we, we know when it comes to consultations. Fravi, anything That's else? It. You all right? Sure. Okay, Kelly, you, your hand up. I'm not going to go through the clauses at all. It's what's not in the bill that I'm sure like many, um, I've been asked questions about the number of licences isn't included in this. Is the department looking at this in any other way? No, um, Kelly, we looked at that um, a good few years ago now. Um, about the, There's two elements there. There's the restriction cap of the number of licences, and then there's the needs provision, whereby once you have obtained a licence, you've got to demonstrate to the court that there is a need for a bar or an off licence in that particular area. Um, so that's to try and control a uh, proliferation of, of, of bars in particular areas. Um, and the, the, the evidence we gathered at that time, and we shared it with the committee back in 2016, um, it was inconclusive. There was, there was strong evidence that it would have an adverse impact on existing licensed premises, um, and there was, there was, it was inconclusive. There certainly wasn't sufficient evidence for a minister to take a decision um, that was quite risky really in the terms of it might have an adverse impact on a lot of jobs and a lot of uh, trade and companies working at hotels and, and bars and um, you, you would want to be very sure that what you were doing was going to be for the, the benefit of the general society uh, so th we can share that, that evidence was gathered then uh, it was quite difficult to to gather all the evidence i wasn't involved in it at the time but i've been through the papers and you're it's, it's, you're trying to find out, you know, how private small businesses are actually operating, and it can be quite difficult to to get under under the bonnet and examine what exactly has happened in a small family firm where people are working long hours and maybe not recording them and, and things like that. But uh, the ministers at the time that have looked at it, the all said that this, this is this is high risk. You know, you're 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 almost making policy and changing laws in hope that it will benefit, without having strong evidence that it will. But I'm just, I was just thinking about it when we come to look at the clauses with yes. those microbreweries, for instance, 
will that be a consideration, you know, for them getting their type of licence, you know, will, will, is that a competition, you know, no, it shouldn't um, be, but... No, no, and yeah. um, they're a different category of licence. We've introduced a new category of licence for those who are producing uh, alcoholic drinks um, and they set separately from the off licences and, and bars. Okay. So the application process then will, well, we'll go through this, but the application process shouldn't be another supermarket or bar would object because it's well, different. Well, they probably we will. try to object, but um, that would be for the courts to decide. No, thank you. We've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Um, Johnny, did you have anything you wanted to ask? Jonathan Buckley? Sure, I'm content at this stage just to, to wait until it comes before us and clause by clause. Brilliant, thanks Johnny. Any other members want to ask any questions? Anybody in the room? Um, nobody has, oh there's Mark's his hand up. Mark, go ahead. No, uh, thank you Chair, thanks for the, the update there. Just uh, like Johnny, I'm content to wait till we're going clause by clause, but just to, as always, declare an interest in this subject okay thank you mark all right okay got off pretty lightly there the day <laughs> you did. Get off lightly the no you'll not <laughs> I, I have to say I, I really and i think as a committee it's going to be this will be our first um bill as this committee to look after and like to look at and i know it fills me i am excited about getting yeah. that blue pack in my hands and scribbling all my notes on it and I'm going through it. i've kept Sadly. every one of them for have every one of them i still have and I know you can't wait either, Fred. Come um, with her, like your mum. <laughs> <laughs> we have a pensions so, bill. Oh yeah, we still have them. Oh, the pensions bill. Yeah, we still have <laughs> it. Yeah, we bag, have yeah. it. But we haven't received it yet either. So we haven't. So I haven't got our blue copy of it either. So and hopefully yeah. we'll get that after the nineteenth. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I look forward to that. So I do. Um, that will be good to have that in our hands. I look forward to working with you all as well. Nope. Thank, thank you very much, Liam, and thank you, Carol, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right. How could I forget the pensions bill? <laughs> Equally important, so it is, absolutely. And we're going to go on now and discuss the pensions bill a little bit further as well. So we're moving then, members. If members are happy, we'll move on to agenda item 8, which is a briefing by the pensions regulator on the pension schemes bill. Um, members, there's no uh, tabled papers for this item and it will be an oral briefing. So can I welcome Nick Gannon and Victoria Holmes to the meeting? You are both very welcome. And I think it's yourself, Victoria, you're going to kick off with a brief for us. It's myself and Nick, yes, good morning. Go ahead. Um, is it, Nick, Nick on the call? I'm just looking for him. Um, I don't see him on the call, is he? No, he's not. I'm being told he's not on the call, so it's just you at the moment. So we'll wait and see if he comes in. Okay, there we need two seconds. I think you're quite okay. <coughs> Technology is a wonderful thing yeah. when it works. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just see where he is. Otherwise, I, I, I can start. Well, if you want to go but, ahead and start, that's okay. That's fine. And if you can join us, if you can send him a wee text message. Send. Um, I've just sent him one. Okay. <laughs> good. No problem. That's grand. No, go ahead, Victoria. Okay. Oh, there he is. We see him now. Welcome, ah, we have Nick as well. Yeah. Apologies for the uh, for the late arrival. Then. No problem. Yeah. I think we're ready to start, Nick. Okay, shall I, I lead off then? Um, yeah, so um, with apologies for the uh, slightly late arrival. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting us here to appear today to provide information about the authorisation of master trusts. I'm Nick Gannon, and you've met my colleague, Vicky Holmes, and we're both policy leads at the Pensions Regulator. We were both heavily involved with the development of the original legislation with the DWP in London. The involvement then continued through the publication of TPR's Code of Practice for Master Trusts and the operational implementation of authorisation and supervision regime. TPR is the regulator of workplace pensions throughout the UK. We have statutory objectives which include measures to improve the way that workplace pension schemes are run and to protect the savings of those who are saving into them. We're very aware of our duties and the responsibilities from legislation passed by the UK government and devolved administrations such as yourselves. A master trust is a trust-based occupational pension scheme which provides money purchase benefits and is used by two or more unconnected employers. Master trusts have existed for many years. And for example, there's a long history of schemes serving workers in specific industries. Master Trust truly came to prominence with the start of automatic enrolment in 2012, where they became the type of scheme most commonly chosen by employers to fulfil their duties. 
Master Trusts often differ from other pension schemes because they're commercial or commercially minded organisations. This means that those running the scheme are more distant from their participating employers and their employees than would be the case in a conventional employer scheme. This distance can lead to a focus on good governance and member experience. However, in the earlier days of automatic enrolment, some master trusts were established that gave us cause for concern. These included examples that were run by people with little or no experience and literally from a spare room. The growth of potentially low quality master trusts concerned us. Our regulatory grip was insufficient to deal with some of the risks that we had identified in the market. The Pension Schemes Act 2017, which the Pension Schemes Bill replicates, was designed to clear, close those gaps. It also required, for the first time, direct authorization of trust-based pension schemes. The process of authorization itself involves a scheme demonstrating to us that it can meet the tough standards set out in legislation. These include having the right people, robust processes, and adequate finances to better protect savers in their scheme. While authorization is a single event, authorized master trusts must continue to satisfy us that they meet the necessary standards throughout their operation. We maintain a supervisory relationship with all authorized master trusts. Any new schemes planning to enter the market must gain authorization before starting to operate. To do this, they must provide evidence outlining how a skill scheme will meet the standards in the five key areas. New schemes are more intensely supervised than existing schemes because they do not have an operational track record. This gives them the opportunity to demonstrate that they will continue to meet the authorization criteria. At the introduction of the regime, master trusts that could not or would not be able to satisfy us that they met the authorization standards were required to lean up, well, wind up and leave the market. Once authorized, TPR has powers to drive improvements in schemes where we see signs of concern. If a scheme is ultimately unable to satisfy us that it meets the required standards, then we may take action to deauthorize it. Our primary concern through our authorization and supervision is to ensure that members' pension pots are, pots are protected. A deauthorization is one of several so-called triggering events that a scheme may suffer. These range from deauthorization by us to changes that affect the financial security or the sustainability of the scheme. After they've experienced a triggering event, master trusts are automatically prohibited from taking on any new employers. They're also prohibited from introducing any new charges or increasing charges on members beyond those that were already in place. This ban on additional charges extends to those schemes taking on members from exiting schemes as well. We monitor the market very closely to make sure that schemes are following the rules. Master Trust leaving the market must submit an implementation strategy to TPR. This sets out how they'll wind up and the expected timescales for doing so. We approve the strategy if it's adequate and if it's in line with requirements set out in legislation. We expect trustees to be able to demonstrate as part of this strategy that members will not incur the cost of transfer or wind up. Schemes must also submit periodic progress reports to us so that we can monitor their progress and act where it's necessary. The trustees of the exiting scheme have got a duty to identify a suitable alternative arrangement and undertake due diligence to ensure that that scheme is appropriate with good governance, value for members, and that it meets automatic enrollment requirements. Where we have concerns, we work with the trustees of the transferring scheme to resolve them. Where needed, we have a range of powers that we may use. For example, when a master trust is winding up, we can use a pause order to put a temporary stop on a range of activities, from payments being made out of a master trust to preventing further monies flowing in. These powers would only be used where there is an immediate risk to members or to scheme assets. The authorization process was carried out to safeguard savers in these increasingly important schemes and to drive up standards in the market. Sorry, bear with me a second. Um, it has improved standards and governance for 16 million individuals saving into those schemes. In response to the authorization process, the master trust market has consolidated by 60%, with just 38 master trusts remaining open today. The £38.5 billion that have been saved into master trust schemes is now better protected than before. We expect the master trust market to continue to grow in terms of the number of members and assets. In other countries where similar regimes have been implemented, there's been further consolidation in the market after authorization. 
We expect that this will be the case in the UK, but we do not have any set targets on the ideal size of the market. Many employers are now moving their existing money purchase schemes to master trusts, and so we expect to see this trend continue. We closely monitor schemes that are in the process of consolidation to ensure that they continue to meet the required standards and that members remain protected. There's currently one master trust in Northern Ireland. This was authorised alongside schemes in the rest of the UK, and this was because it had members throughout the UK, and so it fell under the existing legislation. The legislation that you're currently considering closes off the loophole that exists for a master trust to operate exclusively in Northern Ireland without authorisation. This legislation means that savers in Northern Ireland will be protected in the same way and to the same degree as those throughout the UK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria, and thank you, Nick, for that presentation. Um, I, uh, it is good to hear, and it's good to know that you know that this will in, that will enable um, those savings of, of hard-earned savings of people that are going to be better protected um, than they've ever been before. And I know that from what you're saying, that on no small part it's down to the pension regulator as well and the job that you do <coughs> in monitoring and, and and ensuring that people are following the rules. And I suppose to you, I would just want to add on your part then. Um, that is there, a, I would imagine, then an added workload and an added expense um, for the, the pension regulator in this. Do you want to make any comment on that? So as we, as a regulator, we have broadly moved towards more of a supervisory model because I think that's recognised as active regulation is a good way forwards. So in part of building this regime, we looked at the resources that would be needed to supervise master trust. And while we look at all of them, we do have different levels of supervision. So the ones that we would be more concerned about, newer ones into the market, will get much more regular contact than those where we are happy with what they're doing and there's not a lot of new activity or any exit happening. So we do we focus our activity um, but it was something that was built in well into our operational um, operations. Okay, and thank you for that answer. And just one more question I just want to ask. And I know Nick had mentioned there uh, in, in going back at previous times of some of the major concerns um, around ma uh, master trusts. I think he had mentioned about people setting, setting them up in their own front room. Um, it's just uh, going forward then, um, Nick, I suppose to ask, um, are, are there still um, concerns or are, are you relatively happy on how this legislation um, will protect? Um, we've been particularly pleased by the way that schemes that have fallen under the legislation have uh, actually shifted to comply with it. Uh, we thought there was going to be sort of far more pushback and potentially more problems with those problematic schemes that we had identified. But actually, as it stands at the moment, um, and as far as I'm aware, we've had no problems and everyone has behaved sensibly and reasonably in, in uh, doing what they're supposed to do, certainly to get out of the market and then ongoing those, those schemes in the market. Uh, yeah, we, we currently have no concerns that I'm aware of. No, I, I think it's probably fair to say as well that whereas before this legislation, there was an explosion of people wanting to use an opportunity to get into the auto enrolment market, this legislation has meant that you have to be serious and have resources behind you to want to be able to do it. And it's also fair to say that if anyone tried to enter the market and operate without authorization, we have very decisive abilities in the bill and, and in the act that exists now to be able to simply stop them operating. Okay, okay thank you for that. Um, I'm going to open up for members' questions. Kelly, I know you'd indicated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Victoria. Um, it's very much appreciated today. Nick, you happen to say something there that ties into my question. You talked about those um, pensions that fall um, you know, outside of the legislation, so they're not under the legislation. Um, obviously, Northern Ireland shares a land border with the, the south of Ireland. Um, we may have companies that operate within Northern Ireland whose headquarters are not based within the UK. I'm just wondering um, where there is a pension provided by that company that perhaps isn't even located within the UK. Um, are there any protections that you can provide for the people who are saving with that pensions company, or is that monitored elsewhere? Broadly 
pensions and that's more visible elsewhere. So the uh, pensions regulator does has a role in uh, regulating cross-border schemes, so schemes that operate on, on in this case, both Northern and Southern Ireland. Um, and I'm afraid that, that beyond that, it's kind of outside of my um, sphere of familiarity. But yes, we, we do have um, have powers to intervene. We do have powers to intervene. I'm just I'm just concerned. Say, for instance, if if even if a headquarters was in France, or could be anywhere at all. To be honest, it could be in America. Um, it's how do we protect those people? Is there any um, is there anything that a company has to provide to employees to notify them that their scheme is outside of your regulation within the UK? No, there isn't. I think it's important to note, though, that schemes that operate in the UK do have to be regulated in, or do have to be uh, established in the reg in the UK for tax purposes. Okay. So uh, once they are set up for tax purposes and uh, established, uh, they, they then have to uh, register with us as a pension scheme. So at that point, sort of the UK entity of, of that employer uh, comes under our remit. Oh. So while there may be a headquarters in yeah, in Paris, for the sake of argument, um, the the UK subsidiary is is um, uh, under our regulation, if you like, um, and there have been instances where we we have pursued parent companies across borders. Oh, that 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 gives me a lot of confidence. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. No other member has indicated, Johnny. I know you're not. You're only on audio. Is there anything you want to ask? No, Chair, I'm fine. Thank you. You're OK. No other member want to ask any questions. Uh, look, Nick and Victoria, a, a big thank you. I think actually you have alleviated yeah. some some of the, the fears that the committee would have had um, around this bill. So I really do appreciate your time today in coming and briefing us. And, no um, and thank you. Thank you. OK, thank That's you, fine. Nick. Yeah. All right. Thank bye you bye. Very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Okay, members, um, then we're going to move on to agenda item nine, which is our correspondence. And uh, members, the correspondence memo you'll find at page 131. Can I draw your attention to the effective questioning course outlined in page 165? Um, the CAMS office have organised a professional development workshop for committees on effective questioning and questioning skills. This is a 90-minute online session. I know that these have been run over the years. Various committees have had, um, and again, as I said in an earlier comment, I think it's always good for refresh members who've been here a long time to be refreshed, and also newer members. Um, so, uh, just our members content then that uh, we go ahead and look at that. Or if there any questions or comment on it, happy enough. Mm -hmm. All right. Can I then draw your attention to um, the private rent rented sector 2020 future proofing private rental virtual conference, which is on page 154, and Eleanor Murphy from Reyes will be attending the conference, okay. and then she will report back to the committee. However, if members uh, wish to attend, they're more than welcome to attend. I did note when I looked at it, it was like a 65 pound charge. <laughs> attend the conference and um, as most of us know uh, we, we, we definitely don't pay that because we can't claim it back either um, so um, well, I'm more than happy for Eleanor to attend and, and feedback to the committee members okay with that yeah. yep um, then can I also inform members that yesterday um, you received an email regarding an invitation from the Community Relations Council to join a zoom event on Wednesday the 14th of October um, the event focused on research findings on the current monitoring practices in the good relations sector. Um, members may be interested in joining this event. Um, are members happy enough if they want to join it, they can? That's, that's perfectly up to them. All right. You happy enough with that? Okay. Then can I just then ask members um, any comment they want to make in correspondence? Kelly, then, Fra. Can I just ask, and this is just me just checking, Page 141, you know, we have the, the report that we get on the investment strategy. It, it mentions in that, that under communities that we have some sort of responsibility for inland waterways. Um, to be honest, that's my, as somebody who's surrounded by water down the Arts Peninsula, I'd just love to know what our inland waterway responsibility is. Um, I'm imagining it's something to do with heritage, but I don't know. I just, I'm nosy and I would love to find out. <laughs> okay, well then we'll... We can sure, it goes back to what I asked a couple of weeks ago, uh, that we actually, we get something in writing uh, that outlines what our responsibility is uh, in terms of the, the, the overall department, because we look at some of the major things we deal with, but there are quite a lot of other 
uh, things there. So if, if we could get that, and I, I know that uh, that one of the last times we we were at an event, I think it might have been in a skill. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, and and release ten by water waterways and, and I, but the uh, no that would be good. Uh, yeah, but we can ask for that and ask also for a detailed breakdown of all of the various um, parts of this of this department and this committee because it is it's massive. Um, Fred, do you then want yeah. to come in on another point? Sure, there was just two things there. One at one five seven and one six zero and release the the gambling. Yeah. Uh, thing and uh, the gambling with lives. You know, was a number of good points. Uh, and, and, and that, and uh, the other one again from Sean Graham, uh, gambling consultation. Yeah. I think there's some good points in there, especially about offshore gambling. Yeah. Uh, that I think that are fairly valid. And, uh, on yeah, it. and I think when we get around to actually then looking at the at the gambling bill, um, a lot of those, a lot of the the stuff that has been sent to us over the past few weeks, um, I think it's yeah. important then that that is all included then within our. You know, our yeah. packs again, just to refresh members on yeah. what has been sent through to us. It'll be the same with the licensing bill, um, because yeah. sometimes um, it's quite easy to, for us to forget what we've been sent in previous weeks. Um, so yeah, we keep keep that um, whenever we are coming around to the discussion. Thanks for that, Fred. Um, any other member with anything they want to bring up under correspondence? I don't see any hands up. Johnny, have you anything? No, I'm fine, sir. Get on, thank you. Nothing else then under correspondence. So our members then content um, <coughs> that we to uh, with the actions on the correspondence memo. Yep. Right, good stuff. Thank you. We'll then move on to agenda item ten, which is the forward work program. Um, members, you'll remember that. Or sorry, members, at the meeting next week on the fifteenth fifteenth of October, there will we will be briefed by Retail NI on plans to regenerate town and city centres post-COVID-19. We'll also be briefed by the department on an additional LCM related to the Westminster Pension Scheme Bill. And then finally, we'll also have a briefing from the Northern Ireland Football League representatives on the impact of COVID-19 on local football and the ending of the 1920 season. So are members content for that? That's our next week's meeting. Yep, happy enough. Okay, I'm then going to ask members agenda item 11. Any other business members? Any other business in the room? First of all, no, nothing. Um, Marky, any other business? Nope, you're happy enough. Um, Johnny, any other business? No, I'm fine, sir. Okay, we're all good there. Then I'll move on finally then to agenda item 12, which is date, time, and location of our next meeting. Can I advise you that our next meeting will take place here in room 29 next Thursday, the 15th of October at 10 a.m.? Thank you, members. Thank you, Chuck. Sure. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the